Assalamualaikum. Dr. Celia. Yes, sir. Assalamualaikum. I want to say congratulations. Thank you, sir. Grand victory, I would say. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So I'll call you back. Okay. Assalamualaikum, sir. Assalamualaikum, madam. Assalamualaikum, madam. Assalamualaikum, sir. Assalamualaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Grand Eastern International Virtual Summit 2021 to give innovation a new stage as the slogan of the summit places advancing technology for a better future. Here with you, I am Tariq Ulissam Rimon. Myself, Ajmeran Oshin Sriti. And this is Mahari Naproj. This event is vastly organized by Ekipoli Bangladesh University of Business and Technology Student Branch in collaboration with Ekipoli AIAC Student Branch from Morocco, Ekipoli Student Branch from Rajarata University of Sri Lanka, Ekipoli University of National de San John Student Branch from Argentina, Ekipoli UEMK, Ekipoli PIT, Ekipoli BCE, and IEEE GEC EDUP student branch from India. We also have IEEE ESS THS from Tunisia, IEEE UCET, IEEE CUI, and IEEE HITEC student branch from Pakistan, IEEE SUS TECH student branch from Sudan, IEEE UOM student branch from Mauritius. Achipoli ESP student branch from Ecuador, Achipoli Maribor student branch from Slovenia. And Achipoli METU Northern Cyprus student branch from Turkey, Achipoli UNF Puno as student branch from Peru, Achipoli AAS student branch, and Achipoli Kafral Sheikh student branch from Egypt, Achipoli Kiambogo student branch from Uganda, Achipoli TTU student branch from Jordan, Achipoli MQU student branch from Australia. The International Virtual Summit are carried out by different people on an online forum, bringing people from all over the world. It can attract hundreds of attendees who are able to learn from all of the speakers. It provides better skills, knowledge, and understanding of the latest technologies, enhancing our lifestyle. Hello, hello, is there anyone hear me? Is there anyone hear my voice? Uh, yes. Can I introduce myself? I will carry on. Kathy has a. Can I, can I introduce Our myself? Our summit is conducting, so please, uh, you can introduce yourself later. Please, if anyone wants Asmira, to introduce you can yourself, you can continue. please introduce in the chat box. Please carry on. At the initial stage of the summit, I request the session chair and the vice chancellor of Bangladesh University of Business and Technology, Professor Dr. Muhammad Fayaz Kansar, to deliver his welcoming speech. Thank you, Asmira. Thank you very much, respected keynote speakers, respected participants and guests and dear students. Good evening to you all from Bangladesh. I welcome you all to this International Summit 2021, organized by Bangladesh University of Business and Technology, abbreviated as BUBG, student IEEE student branch and other student branches of different countries. I'm extremely grateful to all the keynote speakers who will give talks on important topics. I'm happy to note that keynote speakers are participating from 16 different countries of the world. It is an, it is an honor for VUBG to have so many resource persons in one session. 
I congratulate ITPD student branch of UBT and other student branch to arrange such a big event within a short span of time. Dear audience, first of all, I would like to congratulate the newly elected office bearers of IEEE 2022. I'm really happy to mention that my former Buid colleague and presently professor of Virginia Polytechnic and State University, USA, has been elected as IEEE president. Also, heartiest congratulations to another dynamic Buid professor, Dr. Celia Sharnas who has been elected as chair of IEEE Women in Engineering 2022 by a wide margin of votes. I hope under the dynamic leadership of the newly elected members, IEEE will move forward at an accelerated pace. We are guests and participants. This is the first time that IEEE student branch of BBT and other screen branches is RNG such a big event. The theme of today's event is advancing technology for a better future. All of us have to keep up the pace with the first technological advancements in the whole world. Otherwise, we will miss the train to reach our goals. Our young scientists and engineers will have to be equipped with the latest technological changes and should generate new ideas to make a better world for our future generations. Think about future automobile, where you can talk to the car through a chip embedded with, with artificial intelligence. After getting down the parking lot, just tell your car to park in a suitable place. The car will follow your command faithfully and will, will get a, a suitable parking. Think about smart human brain, where you can upload and download memories. These are the things which are coming in within a very short span of time. Really, our world is moving very fast. I would again say that our young generations, who are our future leaders, have to adapt to these changes and to make a better future for all of us. Our research persons are going to, be, uh, going to speak on very important topics. I'm sure that everyone participating in the summit will be immensely benefited from their talks. I wish all success for the summit and wish wishes to you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for sharing the inspiring words. Uh, to inform the audience, if uh, whoever wants to introduce themselves, uh, please introduce yourself in the chat box. Dear audience, you know the world is full of diamonds and gems, and we are having some of them here today. With this note, I'd like to give my heartiest welcome to all the keynote speakers. And for the beginning session, I request the IEEE President and CEO 2021, Program Manager of U.S. Missile Defense Department with more than 30 years of industry experience in the application of software engineering methodologies, Susan Cathy Land, to conduct her session and requesting Dr. Celia Shahnas Mem to be prepared for the next session. Susan Cathy Land Mem. Thank you. Uh, let me know if you can see my slides. Yes, can. Okay. yes can see it. All right, thank you. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today at this uh, International Virtual Summit. Um, I was asked to share a few words um, from my volunteer experience um, and the benefits I've derived from a long relationship with IEEE. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about today, and um, I applaud all of the organizers uh, for putting this event together. It's uh, We live in challenging times, and it's good to uh, get together, even though it's virtually. Um, I strongly believe that personal and uh, uh, leadership development 
uh, are a lifelong journey. Uh, any leadership ability is the sum of the activities and challenges we experience, the opportunities we take, and the goals that we set. It's never too late, you're never too old um, to take uh, advantage of uh, resources that are available to you to enhance your skill set um, and either change your, uh, uh, the course of your journey, um, take your career to the next level, um, or um, to make some changes. So I've had a wonderful career. As you heard, I work for a Missile Defense Agency, but I've worked for a variety of, of jobs, and I've always worked in software and systems development. Um, so I uh, had some interesting uh, jobs. Um, I wouldn't change a thing, and I hope you all will take away some of the joy I've had from a career, a career well spent. Um, but IEEE has been a big part of my career and um, has had a strong influence on um, how successful I've been. So, um, so I wanted to start with this. <clears throat> so for those of us who create technology, um, who love how technologies empower us and improve our lives, um, this is why I support IEEE. I think this is why a lot of us support IEEE. Um, the mission and vision of IEEE help us shape the future of technology um, for the benefit of humanity, right? That's our mission. Um, technology is not an industry. It's a method of transforming culture and um, economies of uh, existing systems and institutions, regardless of gender. Uh, technology is a great equalizer uh, because of the application of your intelligence to solve great problems. Uh, technology is not neutral. Its use changes our lives, and the choices developers make can have profound impacts on privacy, security, and even our civil rights as users. Uh, so it's important that developers of technologies be diverse and representative of the populations that they're developing the products for. The people creating technologies are its influencers. Um, a lack of diverse ideas um, and representation could lead to further disparities in gender, class, and race. A community engagement, right, is a powerful technology enabler. And that's what I truly, sorry, my dog is barking. Um, that's what technology, uh, that's what I truly facilitates through its collaborative membership networks and technical communities. Hold on just a minute. I'm going to yell at my dog. Sorry about that, guys. I hope if you have dogs, you'll understand. Um, he's my guard dog. So, all right. So it's important. IEEE really helps the collaborative discussions, uh, the communication, and helps us develop technologies. And that's why I'm a member. All right. So for those of you who are not part of IEEE, um, you know, we always, I join these things and I talk to, to groups and I assume people make assumptions that everybody that's on one of these uh, uh, conferences is a member of IEEE. For those of you who are IEEE members, thank you. I'm honored to be your colleague. For those of you who are not, um, I hope that this um, uh, summit can provide some insight into what IEEE does, um, what it can do for you and what we can accomplish together. I've been a member for um, over 25 years, but I was a volunteer for IEEE for three years before I became a member. So you can participate in IEEE, um, you can do a lot with IEEE without actually being a member, right? Um, uh, but IEEE is the world's largest professional society. It serves all of those working in technology. It's designed to serve all technical professionals. Um, all who are involved in all aspects of electrical, electronic, and computing fields, and all related areas of science and technology. IEEE's field of interest is very, very broad. Um, additionally, to become a member, you do not have to have a college degree. That surprises people. They don't realize that. In recent years, IEEE is positioned now more than ever to mentor those working 
and technology fields. That's where we're, we're positioned. That's where we should be positioned. Um, with required experience, people can join IEEE uh, without college degrees. Um, you just need five years experience. And IEEE is there to help and support those who want to become more active participants in their professions. Our members are vibrant, diverse engineering and scientific professionals uh, working across academia, industry and government who are committed to elevating their professional images, expanding their global networks, connecting to others locally, because uh, we have uh, local um, footprints and giving back to their communities. So um, our members, uh, uh, that's what we call people who join our AAA, our members and volunteers, uh, define technology state of the art. They educate, collaborate and innovate. They develop um, and define industry standards and they leverage the power of technology to advance the human condition throughout the world. What our members and volunteers do uh, throughout the globe is truly astounding. Um, IEEE brings together not only engineers, um, but technologists from the fields of computer sciences, information technology, physical sciences, uh, biological and medical sciences, mathematics, technical communications, education, uh, management, law, and policy. And what I've just recited is our field of interest, so it's very broad. So our members join um, so they can connect with others and share ideas and to obtain knowledge. So um, it's the best thing you can do for your career. It's the best thing I ever did for my career. Uh, my personal mission as an IEEE volunteer is to make IEEE the best place for technical professionals to engage. Um, IEEE strives to create a culture of inquiry um, in which professionals can bring diverse experiences, viewpoints and perspectives together to bring forth truly wondrous accomplishments. And that's going back to uh, what I talked about at the beginning is why? Because technology matters. So who am I? So this is an overview of my career. Um, and in part of who I am is the direct result of, uh, of my environment and that that all of us are, right? Um, our past and present, um, and again, are the choices we make. Um, and what is relevant to all of you is that my background is, is defense centric, you know, the defense industry, industrial complex, as you've heard that term. Um, but I've spent my career supporting some program or project associated with the Department of Defense. Um, and, uh, but I will tell you, that what's important to understand is that I found IEEE kind of by accident um, when I was working at the 46 test wing uh, uh, around 1994, and I was leading teams of software developers. And this was when software engineering was in its infancy. Um, and it was really not a defined engineering field, but IEEE was leading in the area of software engineering and defining the practice of software engineering and they had software engineering standards and they still do and i found the software engineering standards and i used them to train these uh programmers that i had who were just a bunch of hack programmers that's what honestly was being graduated from the the universities people who could code but didn't understand how to elicit requirements or document software design or test software so it was very hard when you had you know large huge software programs that you were required to to produce and i've i've been responsible my whole career for software production um to uh, get these programmers who were young programmers and then develop software products so and that's how I found IEEE through their software standards. So anyway, that's how I got involved and I've been involved ever since. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the different parts of IEEE and what they might <clears throat> have to offer you. Um, some people, when they get involved, like I got involved with the Standards Association, I'm still involved with the Standards Association. But then they don't realize that IEEE is very, very big and there are other things to offer. So IEEE is one of the leading producers of standards in the world. Um, and as the world becomes more integrated, there's a growing need for standards to help with the connectivity. Um, and I, as I explained, I came to IEEE through standards and um, 
Uh, IEEE SA is what we call it, Standards Association. The SA is the leading uh, standard a consensus building organization that nurtures, develops, and advances global standards. So uh, yes. what makes the environment so unique um, and of value is that um, it fully adheres to the World Trade Organization's principles for international standards development. So you can see that there are, um, uh, they work with ISO and ANSI, and um, uh, there are uh, over 200 corporations that participate as well. So if you're interested in working in standards, yes. Ma'am, I'm sorry to interrupt. You have only five minutes remaining for conducting your session. Please try to conclude yourself. I'm aware. I'm aware. I'm aware. Thank you very much. No problem. No problem. Thank you. Kathy is our chief guest here. We are here to listen to Kathy. We can wait. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'll be done in five minutes. There's also technical activities, which is uh, these are the societies and councils that you can participate in. Um, and people are not aware of the, the range of societies and councils, I mean, societies that are uh, available. And you can see these range from broadcast society, oceanic engineering society to uh, like the computer society. And if you're interested, you can go to the link at the, uh, at the bottom of the screen or just go online to IEEE.org and search for societies. But there are also technical councils. These are free to add to your membership and you can participate and add, uh, add these to your membership. And these are a great opportunity for uh, leadership opportunities. Uh, they have a seat on the technical activities board. Um, so I would, it would encourage you to add these to your membership as well. Technical communities are also free to join. And you can see the list here. And if you want to sign up for a technical community that is in your area of interest, go to IEEE.org, future directions. Uh, many opportunities for uh, continuing your professional education with IEEE. Uh, there are hundreds of hours of online uh, mobile friendly courses. Um, there's an e-learning library. Uh, they offer things like cybersecurity, ethical hacking, um, Go and see if there's something that you're interested in. Many of these are five or ten dollars uh, to take, and they're they're great. They really will help keep you up to date on, on cutting edge uh, uh, technology. So there um, is a uh, what they've been building is an uh, educational talent development pipeline. We're starting with STEM K through 12 uh, to engage teachers, students, parents, and volunteers. Um, and it's tri engineering. And then, so that's uh, pre university and then university uh, for uh, the accreditation of uh, uh, teaching programs. Um, and then also uh, with HKN, which is the Honor Society. And then um, we have professional development with our uh, learning network. So, um, IEEE is centered on our members, uh, volunteers, um, and, um, and really technology. And uh, uh, as students and young professionals, uh, you're valued, your uh, participation is important. Um, and every member um, I meet, every volunteer I meet, um, I value uh, your strength, your participation, um, and your commitment. Uh, I believe you're the key drivers of uh, tomorrow's innovations. You're integral to advancing technology for humanity. Um, and I want you to know that I'm personally committed to you uh, and um, your enthusiasm, your sense of camaraderie helps bolster our efforts to build strong partnerships worldwide. Um, and um, uh, let's see, I'm going to go to the next slide. I'm trying to hurry up. So, um, as I said, uh, our, I'm going to directly talk to our students and young professionals who are online today. Um, you have an important role to play in IEEE. Um, the, one of the reasons I give this talk is that I want to encourage young professionals and students to stay engaged with IEEE, to see if there's a place 
um, across the breadth of IEEE about some of the things I talked about, um, a, a um, society, a council, um, see if there's somewhere that you can engage and become um, uh, engaged as a volunteer. Uh, as technology continues to reshape our world, uh, there is a place for you to become engaged in IEEE and to uh, collaborate with others to have an impact um, uh, with the mission and vision of IEEE. Um, so uh, the one thing I do wanna to touch on really quickly is that one of the things that IEEE made for me that was a big, a big difference for me uh, is the intrinsic soft skills. So um, I've been responsible for delivering software uh, and systems for years. And as a hiring manager, uh, the one thing that separates the good from the great, uh, especially with technical people, are the soft skills. Um, you can have the most talented programmer in the world, but if they can't talk to a customer uh, to elicit requirements or they can't talk to a customer about, uh, about the product that they need, uh, then they're not as good as the next programmer that can, right? So one thing that IEEE can do for you, uh, any association can do for you is really develop your soft skills, right? Communication skills, teamwork, critical thinking, that type of thing. Very important. Um, and that's really what uh, working with an association, working with a volunteer organization uh, really does, and it separates the good from the great. So think about that when you're making the decision whether to stay engaged with a nonprofit or a volunteer organization. Um, so uh, I wanna encourage you to uh, never stop learning. Uh, uh, look forward, stay uh, uh, engaged, Always look for uh, emerging technologies. That's a really great thing about IEEE. They seem to stay on the cutting edge. Um, uh, uh, reach out, find out about some professional development opportunities. Um, continue your education and learn something new every day. Uh, the value of IEEE membership is tremendous. Uh, uh, celebrates everybody's achievements. Um, I found it to be a very, very um, uplifting organization, especially from the peers, the members that I meet, the other volunteers that I've come to know over the years. It's just a, an uplifting organization. Um, and um, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak, and I wish you the best on your virtual summit uh, international conference today. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, Kathy. Students, if you have Thank any you. questions, feel free to ask Kathy. And I wanted to congratulate you on your election to uh, recently. Congratulations so much again. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, receiving your call was the best thing and on that night. And I, want to, I mm -hmm. wanted to talk to you more. I know you had a series of call to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, actually the standard association, what you have said, you know, it's pretty important. Uh, you can shed some more light how the students can enhance or increase their interest and know more about the standard association mm -hmm. because many of the students will not go to academia like me they will go to industry in case of industry how important the standards are they really need to know it it will be great yeah. to listen from you so that was the best thing i ever did was becoming involved in a standards working group and you do not have to so the standards association if you join is an additional fee on your membership um, and it can be pretty expensive but you can join a standards working group for free you don't have to be a member of the standards association i wasn't even a member of ieee for three years i worked in a standards working group and i wasn't a member of ieee and i wasn't a member of the standards association but when you want to ballot on the standard you're working on, that's when I joined IEEE. That's how they hooked me. 
So um, you can go to the IEEE website and you go to look at standards and then you go and look and see what um, working groups are active. And then you email the working group chair, or I think there's actually a way on the website to sign up to volunteer to work in a working group. And you can just participate in the working group and that's how you sign up for standards. So um, there's lots of different, I think there's there's a lot of working groups that right now um, there's like 3000 active standards and I think there's 900, uh, there's 3000 standard nine, 900 active. So at any one time, there's just, you know, I don't even know how many active working groups there are, but there are quite a few. So I would, I would advise everybody to go up and look and see if there's a standard you're interested in. Yeah, the other thing I would advise, the other thing I would advise everybody to do is if you're not on IEEE Collaboratech, IEEE Collaboratech, if you go to the IEEE website, IEEE.org, in the upper right hand corner is a little C, and you don't have to be a member. Um, if you are a member, there are additional benefits, but you can go in there. It's the social networking platform for IEEE. There's all kinds of stuff in there. You can find a mentor. You can um, network with other people. There's all kinds of blogs. So I would get on Collaboratech and see what's going on in Collaboratech. That's a very important information. I came to know about Dietary Collaborative from John Day when I met him in 2016. And immediately I took initiative to form the collaborative community for Bangladesh. You know, the mm -hmm. students should, what you are saying, uh, to find the mentors, to find the papers and other things. They may join collaborating and utilize the opportunities for real networking mm -hmm. there. Thank you, Kathy, for shedding the light on two very important points, which are really relevant and uh, valuable for the students. Do you, do you can, uh, can you tell something to them about IEEE STEM portal or IEEE new volunteer portal that you have been- Yeah, so the, yeah, the volunteer, yeah, the volunteer portal, we have both. There's a new STEM portal, which I think would be there unless they're, working with STEM, but the volunteer portal is really more interesting to them. Um, and, and they could go to the IEEE.org and this uh, type in volunteer in the search, and then they can find it. Um, Cause I don't remember the link right off my head, top of my head, but if they want to volunteer, um, they can go <clears throat> and, and it's provides you with either the short term or long term volunteering opportunities, but you can search and you can say, oh, I want to work in a conference or, oh, I want to do this. I want to you know, review papers or I want to work on a committee or there's lots of different volunteering opportunities and they can search until they find one that suits something that they might be interested in and then, you know, put their name in for it so that we try to make, you know, people but we're getting very frustrated. You know, I want to volunteer. I want to do something. I want to, and, and so we're trying to make it as easy as possible for people to find something to do that that, that is a good fit. Thank you, Kathy. It's very interesting. I'm also just. I will talk here. So I'm just collecting few questions I know which are very important, and you are passionate about it. So that's why I raise those questions so that really student dig into them and find the values to it. These are the three important things I wanted to hear from you so that students really know about it because they're not asking any questions. Yeah, Tabil, they're, if you they're have, very shy. <laughs> yes, Tabil, if you have no question, ask one more time for the students. Uh, so I know these three things are valuable and Kathy is very passionate about it. And he is, she is advocating them all over the world. It's your time to really embrace those opportunities. Tabil, if there is no other question, would you please take a group photo because Kathy may leave for a meeting. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Who is taking uh, the photo? Please, everyone, uh, turn on your camera and we are going to take some pics. 
Yes, it's a, it's a it's your time. So many student branches you came together to meet Kathy. Yes, Anyone who's taking it? It's done. It's done. Thank you. Tarikul, proceed if you want to thank. Thank you, ma'am, for your important demonstration. Uh, and now I would like to request IEEE Women in Engineering Committee Chair elect of 2022 and the chair of IEEE SPS Women in Signal Processing Committee and IEEE Women in Engineering History Subcommittee, Dr. Celia Shahnaz, ma'am, to start her session and requesting Dr. Reem Sharma, ma'am, to get prepared for the next session. Thank you very much. And uh, I like to thank first Kathy for making her valuable time to listen to uh, the call of so many student branches who came together and she shared a very important and valuable things you know we have to listen to more because you all are very potential but if we listen to the stories of role models you can find the points where you can fit yourself and if you can get the confidence that you can do it. This is very important to get the guidelines, to listen to the stories and to listen to the valuable experience of our uh, great leaders. And, uh, you know, uh, you can always uh, do well if you can follow others and you can build your leadership. It is important what Kathy mentioned that, you know, you have to focus on your learning and never stop learning. That is the important, uh, I should say, the takeaway for all of you. You are young, so it has so many years and way to go for you. So let me share my screen very quickly. Uh, let me share my screen very quickly. I hope you can see my screen, right? Is it visible? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much uh, for inviting me for uh, sharing some thoughts with you. Uh, I really request you to uh, humbly uh, visit my Google Scholar citations and uh, and my brief profile so that you really know uh, that in which area I can help you. This is very, very important. And there is always power of networking, I believe. And you must be, uh, and I, I suggest you to be innovative in your every state. You know, this is PS Day celebration and IEEE Day celebration by our women in engineering group. It was a human chain led by me and I had connected the scholars, our industry experts or industry. And sorry, uh, Peter, uh, your screen is not visible now. Skin is not visible? Yes, ma'am, it is not visible. Somebody, somehow, somebody, uh, it's, uh, somebody said it's visible. Ma'am, it was visible, but uh, now uh, I Is it okay? Where... Is it okay now? Yes, ma'am, now uh, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. You know, I believe in power of networking and also I suggest you to be innovative in your nature and in your every state. And these are the two human chain I led, Power and Energy Society death celebration and IEEE death celebration by our women in engineering affinity group. You know, it's not only a human chain to me, it's a connectivity that helped me 
to finding my uh, research papers, uh, finding my uh, computational facilities, because I use deep learning, I need high computational GPU and many other things. And in the left side bottom, you can find uh, the societies and the affinity groups where I have been involved through my technical research and other professional activities. And since we are living in subcontinent, it is always important to connect your research and innovation or any activities to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. You know, there are 17 Sustainable Development Goals, like sustainable cities and communities. And IEEE is so great. It has a special group for IEEE Smart Grid, IEEE Smart Cities, IEEE Brain Initiatives, and so many things, IEEE Entrepreneurship Community, like that. So, not changing and now this COVID-19 is here for applying your research or your innovation you do not just you do not not just need to wait to be a PhD you know you can think about solving a problem in the community and provide technological solution you can design an automatic hand sanitizer and you can really think and collaborate with all student branches, request your honorable vice chancellor so that it can be deployed to the rural community where they really need it. And you know, this COVID when started, you know, and it was a curse for many of us, but you know, my students were sent back to the um, village home from the hostels. And I really encourage them to collect the chest X-ray images to know whether it is COVID-19 positive or COVID-19 negative to give it an automatic detection. And they were so excited. They started collecting X-ray images, CT images, ultrasound images together. And finally, after 1.5 years, they came up with a very good architecture, CAPSCOVNET, to detect COVID-19 automatically uh, uh, from multimodal imaging techniques. And recently it has been published in IEEE Transactions on Artificial Intelligence. So you can read such papers so that you can really know how to collect the database, how to collect data from your local community, how to build your Python skill. So there are so many items here and it is an interdisciplinary research. Although I'm a professor from Tripoli, it, is an, it's an, it needs knowledge of computer vision, it needs knowledge of computer programming. So it's a huge thing. And also there, are, there is a huge problem of musculoskeletal radiographs abnormality. You know, because 1.7 billion people are suffering from this disease. So I really try to choose a problem that will give solution to the billions of people. That's why my students have developed a capsule network for ab abnormality detection from such radiographs. And also tuberculosis detection these are some examples you can choose for biomedical research using artificial intelligence because we are uh, we are embracing uh, the fourth industrial revolution. So these are items where you can work and you can concentrate, and you know you can really apply different deep learning techniques and assemble together to really uh, detect tuberculosis and you can read the papers to really know more about it. And you know, I always encourage you to participate in global competitions. In last uh, October in ICIP, it's a flagship conference of signal processing society. You know, there was a competition was launched for distortion classification in laparoscopic videos. You know, my students have developed a DISNET network to really help designing the distortion classification so that the manual error coming from the surgery can be overcome. So these are highlights and these are problems you can think about. And this is the detail of the DISNET network. And these are different types of laparoscopic uh, distortions that you can find in laparoscopic videos. And this is a shallow network 
that students have designed. And most important is the self attention part. You can read more about it. And this is the learning craft. That means when you are using any learning model, the most question important is how accurate it is. And what is the loss? You know, our method is showing uh, better accuracy with lower loss. This is an important learning, but when you go to the performance, accuracy loss, and there is another statistical score that is called cohen kappa score. And also you need to know how your model is working for the unseen data. This is very, very important. Now, since it is a laparoscopic video distortion classification, another important point for you, maybe what is the timing? You can see in the competition, my students method was top three, but for a timing, it was the fastest, which are important points for our innovation and research. And that's also another important thing, denoising of ECG signal, uh, seizure activity classification from the brain signal. These are published in biomedical signal processing and control. You can read more about it. And we are now working on designing different deep learning network to solve those problems, to reduce computational complexity, do it faster, help the doctors to take the decision very fast and more accurate way. And you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a huge advocate of women empowerment through research. And I know our women are suffering from skin cancer, but skin diseases, but they're shy to do it to do the diagnosis. So these are digital images and you can see there are a lot of problematic areas. We call it region of interest, you know, and you can apply deep learning techniques to find the region of interest at the same time. Uh, you can also uh, help uh, taking the document, taking the decision in a faster and accurate way. And one day you can think about transforming this whole thing in an app so that it can be accessible by anyone in the hill tracks area or in the rural community. You know, in Bangladesh or in the world or in the Africa or in the Sri Lanka or in any other parts of Indonesia, you cannot really guarantee that everybody who needs to measure glucose and monitor glucose and they have glucometer because it is expensive and it is also invasive. So you can think about non-invasive blood glucose estimation, you know, and you can launch yourself as an entrepreneur. And this is the way of transforming your project ideas into product. You can check about it in the IEEE Explorer. And also jaundice detection. This is very important for neonates. A lot of neonates are suffering from jaundice, but you know, my students are not mechanical students, but still they have developed this mechanical structure, handmade goggles, adjustable chin rest, like that. You know, the Hiltrex mother can send the image of the sclera of the child uh, to the server and server can do the deep learning to do the take the decision and doctor can access it remotely and send the decision uh, very quickly. And most important to work with the disabled community. If you want to ensure education, entertainment and accessibility for them in future. I was working with sign language. I found that everything is English, but you know, I speak Bengali and we speak Bengali. And there are a lot of people, maybe around fifth or sixth rank language in the world, Bangla. So we have developed the Bengali sign language alphabet recognition system. My students have created this database uh, working with uh, the Deaf and Dumb Association of Bangladesh. And we applied deep learning technique, VGD19 neural network to solve the problem. You know, I have a dream that one day we will make an interface so that a student can come to the university, can order a book in the library using this sign language and go to the canteen like you can order a food. And, you know, it is very important what Cathy said, celebrate the recognition of people. Uh, celebrate and recognize people. And most important thing is that uh, to celebrate, there are different days. Uh, at a level as they recently celebrated. We invited Laila, who was 2020 IEEE Computer Society president. Our uh, IEEE president, Kathy, is also, uh, was also Computer Society president. So it is important to listen from those so that from their research, you can really try to fit it in, in your research. And that will be a good resource 
sharing. And since I'm chairing Women in Signal Processing for DNA region, I encourage you to join Signal Processing Cup and video, video image processing cup competitions. It's not important to always rank high. My team was ranked fourth in SP Cup 2020 and VIP Cup, it was ranked fifth. But I told them, you know, and in 2015, they were also ranked fifth and they were very upset. I told that you don't need to be upset. Let us do some more work. And we published the journal papers. Then one student got admission in University of California, Riverside, and another got admission in Princeton University. You know, this is the outcome, the bringing opportunities to the students like you, which I didn't get in my life, you know. And Kathy was a great contributor all the time. Uh, in ICAS, Women in Signal Processing, she contributed really a great and uh, encouraged our signal processing researchers. And also we work so much on diversity and inclusion. Uh, and uh, and uh, we had a lot of initiatives to really ensure uh, that the best practices are shared among technical societies, among us. And, and there are a lot of opportunities coming where you can share your knowledge. I typically balance this section are, is organizing co-located conference from December three to five. Uh, this Omen in Engineering Conference for which I was a founder in 2015. Now it is it in its seventh year. There are uh, another conference, PIACON, RIACON, SPICSCON, BESITCON. This is the concept of co-located conference so that you can share your experiences, research contributions, and multidisciplinary research and more collaboration. And uh, these are region and technology conference. I, I'm sharing some big conferences that Bangladesh did. You can also join over the world. And also this week on EC, then 2015, uh, it was founded in Bangladesh. And then between Bangladesh and Pune, Bangladesh, Uttar Pradesh, Bangladesh, Thailand, Bangladesh, Bangalore, Bangladesh, Bhubaneswar. And I shared it is coming uh, and also International Women in Engineering Leadership Summit where near, there is not only leadership. We talked about uh, a nuclear power energy education because, because our country is uh, investing much on nuclear power energy education. And we have to really uh, encourage our men and women all together to really embrace those technological achievements. And this instance in 2020, the first region and flagship conference um, which was fully virtual and I was serving as a general chair of that and I thank to all the volunteers and in future we will do more together I'm just giving you some examples so that you never miss them and you join them if it is possible to join virtually and we also did international COVID-19 congress to know what our researchers around the world are doing in COVID-19. And recently we did International Women in Engineering COVID-19 Congress. I was amazed to see that what our uh, women, men are thinking about research innovation and work-life balance during COVID-19. It's a really amazing experience for us. I learned a lot, lot from them. And these are some errors you can get and you can also get it yeah, but you do not need to start it from the scratch the way I started. I will be there to mentor you if you need any support to reach out to me. These are some of our group hours. Women in India in Bangladesh became the best in the uh, region 10 and become the best in the whole world. It's a great encouragement for all of us. I was the first female chair of Bangladesh in its 25 years history. I work very hard to encourage all of you to win. I took the MG Outstanding Last Section Award for my section. It's an honor. Now it is your responsibility to bring it again to our country. And it is always a great honor to receive those awards from, uh, for mentees from great leaders like I took the president, uh, Jose Mora. And why you will do technical activities? It is very important. Uh, can, you can bring achievement for your community and you can increase visibility to the rest of the world. Our 2020 IEEE EMBS, um, uh, uh, our EMBS chapter has received this EMBS Regional Outstanding Chapter Award, and also our SPS has received chapter certification very quickly by designing a lot of conferences, distinguished lecture program, winter school, summer school. Don't miss the opportunity. Connect to the researchers, connect to your 
future reviewers, your future postdoc guide, your future PhD supervisor, and reshape your life. And we can change the world because we are engineers, but it is important to share the resources and work together and always upskill yourself and never stop learning as Kathy said. So thank you very much. I really congratulate you for this International Virtual Summit and gathering so many student mentors together and it became a virtual world. Hope we can work together beyond the border. It is important to exchange the resources beyond the border. Thank you, and I wish you all the best. Take care, stay blessed. If you have any question, please ask me in the chat box. Hello. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, we want to... Uh, make a photo session with you, especially with you. Uh, can everyone uh, turn on your camera? Is it done? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And thank, thank you very you. much. Yes, I congratulate all the speakers for dedicated, uh, for dedicating their time and talent for these young students. And if you need any collaboration, please reach out to me. I'll be happy to help you. Thank you very much. Okay, yes, in Patwari Bhai, are you here? Hello. Okay. Uh, I'm requesting you to uh, make co-host Safa, Maharin, and Arifuri Samrifat. At this moment, I'm welcoming the head of Department of Electrical Engineering at Shiksha Anushandhan Dean Student University, Professor Dr. Venishama Ma'am to commence our session and requesting Professor Dr. Angan Chakrabarti Sir to draw for the next session. Thank you. Ma'am, you can start your demonstration. Thank you, thank you. Very good evening, Professor Sidya Sehnath. I'm very glad to join this. Am I audible? Yes, yes, my screen is visible. No, screen is not visible. Start sharing. Is it visible now, ma'am? Yes, it's, it's visible now. Thank you. 
Very good evening to one and all present over here. I'm glad that Madam Professor Celia Senas has invited me for this wonderful occasion of International uh, Summit 2021. Uh, the topic for deliberation for today by me will be a framework for cost benefit analysis to improve resiliency of energy system. I would like to say that there are may various frameworks suggested by various people, various industries, but why resiliency is important. We know that high impact, low frequency events are very, very dangerous. So resiliency is going to include the ability to harden the power system against and quick recover from these high impact, low frequency events. Such events, they threaten the lives, they usually disable the communities and divorce the generation, transmission and distribution system. As well as uh, some of the transportation, fuel transportation and communication is disturbed. Some of you can enlist like natural events like hurricanes, uh, flooding, tornadoes, Severe geomagnetic disturbances, GMDs, like solar storms, they have uh, demonstrated their ability to disrupt the power grid in 1989. We have uh, watched, we have uh, visualized the lead GMD has led to the collapse of hydrocubic trans energy interconnection, leaving 6 million people without power for nine hours. So many more like EMP and pandemic, these are severely affecting our power system. Other trends and the events in the last decades, what we have further shaped the need for enhancing the resiliency are like digitalization of society and shifting consumer expectations, like anticipated severe shortage of fuels or water for power generation weather impact on growing valuable generations, growing dependence on natural gas for electric power, vulnerability of extreme cold weather condition, the list is not ending here, many more are there. Now, how these are interconnected, resiliency, flexibility, and connectivity. Low impact and low frequency event, they are impacting resiliency, like I mentioned, extreme weather, earthquake, and man-made outage, physical, cyber, or maybe coordinated. Whereas flexibility, fuel price is one, which is going to affect. And when we talk about flexibility, flexibility refers to power system ability to adapt to the changing conditions while providing safe electricity, reliability, which is uh, can be afforded by a normal man. Several factors are driving the requirement of flexibility in both supply and management. So fuel price is one of them, power market price incentive is another, variable generation. Yes, regulation and policy also, one of the uncertainties and consumer behavior is also adding to it. So flexibility is, adopt the changing conditions which are uncertain. Connectivity when we talk interoperability across the electricity enterprise is important. Like we can have a two-way flow of communication. We have mobile devices for uh, resuming our um, um, resiliency for grid mon uh, modernization. We need connectivity we need advanced sensor to have a robust power system. When we talk about this power system resiliency, three elements plays a vital role. That is damage prevention, that is robustness or hardening the system. Second is a system recovery and third is a survivability. So damage is how can we can prevent this damage. Is an application of engineering design we have to have advanced technology that is going to make our system robust so that the damage is limited. And we talk about system recovery, 
then we need to use the tools and the technology and techniques to restore the system as soon as possible in a practical manner. So here we can see these are some assessment need to be made when we go for system recovery. When we go for survivability, then it is a use of innovative technologies to lead to aid the consumers and also uh, communities, institutions, and wherever they are used, the technology is used, how innovatively these technology can bring back, can work normal, even though in abnormal conditions. When we talk about power system, four component, four pillars, we just can't forget. That is generation, transmission, distribution, and not the less consumer system. So the improvement can address the need of robust system against recovery from enhancement of survivability of the effect of low frequency events, but high impact events. And there is a point, the need of resiliency. When I say generation, we need to have fuel supply. We should have fuel storage. We need to have proper fuel transportation, grid integration, and like when we talk about transmission, then bell storage, smart grid, and bulk system operations. Likewise, we have distribution, distributed storage, distributed generation, smart grid. These are going to take care, must be taken care in the distribution. And in the consumer system, smart grid, thermal storage, distributed generation, distributed storage must be taken care of. When we talk about what is cost benefit analysis, in, for resiliency, we know that it is now the growing trend, the critical need for enhancing resiliency in electric power sector. There's a no standard framework for assessing resiliency level or evaluating the potential option for improvement. So the goal of it is to prevent damage, recover and survive, and is to limit the associated cost. So a flexible framework for cost benefit analysis it is going to help um, to evaluate or pr prioritize the investment to improve the power system reliability, resiliency and uh, to weigh their value relative to other users of scarce capital. When I say EPA has developed a general framework for such analysis to inform utility grid investment in addition to typical challenges which are related to infrastructure investment. It can be a decision that can be important this uh, distinction when considering resiliency. So I said earlier also, it introduces new complexity. When we talk about resiliency, we, we, if we go with the innovation, then the complexity increases and it's due to emerging risk in changing, not only in natural, social, but also in the economic environment. So it's a methodology. Cost benefit analysis is a methodology and it is used by several companies in order to invest or in estimate what is the likely cost and the benefits of their subjected projects. So CBA is going to employ several tools for addressing uncertain outcomes and values, including sensitivity, probability, and break-even analysis. There are four approaches in determining the CBA. That is nothing but engineering uh, estimate, and another is parametric model. Another is uh, analogy estimate and Dalphi method. So when we go for medium uh, projects, small to medium projects, they do not, which are not going to take a longer time to complete it, their benefit analysis is going to perform good. And in uh, there are uh, these cases uh, where, where the project length is less, analysis can guide those involved in making the right decisions. However, when the project is large and long-term project, that can be problematic. And uh, once it is a problematic, then uh, in terms, how it is problematic in terms of cost benefit analysis. So the aim of the cost, including the investment, um, activities, what is the market need and expenses. So all those things has to be taken care of. When we go for uh, 
Various approaches for conducting the cost benefit analysis of the steps need to be followed. We can take it as a step or we can take it that these are mandate need to be done before uh, going for any project. That is de uh, defining the project goal and objectives, then determining the alternatives, who will be my stakeholders, determining the outcome of the costs and benefits, then identifying, classifying what is the cost and what is the benefit. Your lot of calculations are there behind it. With the matrix, what we are going to find out, what conclusions we are getting, then we are going to set up the time for cost and benefit. Then what is the discount cost and the benefit to obtain the present value? Then finding out the net present value of the project and sensitivity analysis is mandatory, then final decision making. So these are the various approaches for conducting the cost benefit analysis. So if I conclude, then I can say that uh, cost benefit analysis is based on future projections that may, may not come true. As a result, CBA model include a significant amount of uncertainty. And CBA models can account for uncertainty and uh, variability like various natural disasters and the fluctuation in prices. So sensitivity analysis is used in CBA model to evaluate the model underlying what are the assumptions taken by the model and see that how changing these assumptions can affect the project outcomes, right? So resilience uh, who, are practice, uh, who are practicing this have made a lot of progress uh, in recent years towards measuring and quantifying the benefits of resilience in ventures. So separately, not well-established best practices, the method exists for monetizing benefits so that they can be compared to cost, right? Marrying with the economic analysis to the big emerging from the field of resilience measurements, it allows resilient practices and research to develop an understanding for cost effectiveness and for their interventions. And these are a few references I took for my presentation. Thank you so much. I hope I'm in time. Hello. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your demonstration. Um, thank you. If you have any question about uh, this, you can ask in chat box. Now, I would like to request the Director of School of Information Technology at University of Calcutta, Head IT and Technology Cell of Higher Education Department, Government of West Bengal, Professor Dr. Omlan Chakraborty Sar to get going with his session and requesting Lalita Vadlamani ma'am to get prepared for the next session. Okay, uh, thank you all. And uh, thanks Professor uh, Selina for inviting me. I will make a very brief presentation on some of the recent works what I'm doing in computer vision. And that is a very interesting domain where we try to try to see how networks right can be a, play a useful role in video analytics so i hope that my screen is visible to all of you and i am perfectly audible am i audible and my screen is visible to all of you uh, you are audible but your screen is not visible now okay 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 i, I just, just okay i didn't share it sorry So now I hope it's visible, right? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So, okay, so let's move on. So what is deep learning? I, I think most of us here uh, knows a bit about deep learning because this is the, uh, this is the buzzword in, in machine vision or also in the other domains, right? But to, but to give a very, a very brief overview of what is deep learning. Deep learning means that how we try to try to generate the feature space, build the feature space from a very low level feature space, right? We go on using the filters which abstract the features, right? And fill and this 
filters are applied in layers, right? It is, it is simply like, suppose we want to summarize a book, right? How we should go, we can, we can just, first of all, we can read the words of each page, right? And then we can summarize that page, right? And then we can go through each of the pages of a chapter, and then we summarize the chapter. Right, and then we and then we actually make a summarization of all the chapters, and then we summarize the book. So the so the same way, same way we move on from the low level features to the high level features, and and we try to make it very easy for the classifier, which is there at uh, at the end of my network, so that it can actually understand in the very complex uh, scene what I have offered. Okay, and that's the that's the exactly that's that's a very similar the, the the way the human brain also works. So the term deep network is basically two or two okay has two uh, two meanings. Okay, one meaning is that it is a deep network, uh, means it has number of layers, right? So that it can go from a very low level abstraction to a very high level abstraction, right? And the other other is that it can extract a very very deep. Uh, deeply seated information what we offer right and that's the that's the beauty of the deep networks and these deep networks are basically based on this on this convolution filters right which uh, which which abstract the features at different layers this convolution feature this convolution filters have a very uh, we can just derive it from our conventional neural network where we have the weight multiplied by the inputs Instead of simply weight multiplied by the inputs in the convolution neural network, what we do, we try to define a size of a filter, right? And we try to define a dimension of a filter and, and that dimension of the filter doesn't occur on the entire image, but it works on the, on the patches of the image so that it can try to tap the, the features which are spatially Located, co-located features, and that's that's the difference between the neural network where we uh, uh, where we actually offer the data at one shot, but in the case of convolution neural network, we uh, we apply these filters, okay, at the at the patches of the image, and that's the way we try to abstract the in the feature space. Now, if we if we look into this, right, we see there there are multiple multiple operations apart from the convolution filters, right? Obviously there is something called the activation layer where we try to uh, okay, try to push, push something with a higher value, with a higher level of activation. And we try to uh, try to push out, okay, the other values which are, which are not, not above a threshold or which are below a threshold, okay? The other part of this is a subsampling, which is done by the max pooling layer. But the subsampling actually tries to compress the image, and we are and and when we go with a, the entire image, this is a subsampled subsampled image. It means that we are actually going from the very uh, uh, very specially specially collocated collocated features to the gross features of my image. Right, and that is also done. So, so initially we'll see that the filters works on a larger dimension, but as we go higher up, the filters works in a in a smaller dimension because this uh, these filters uh, so that we can actually have a subsample space and we can move from the very low level features to the gross features of the image. Right, and that's that's done by the max pool. And once we have it done, then we can actually make a make a simple neural network classifier at the end, right? Which can, which task is very easy to, to classify it because, because all the high level features are now available. And based on the high level features, the classifier can, the classifier can easily take a decision. Now, now if we look into that actually identifies or classifies the levels of the particular given image. For example, we started with an with a image of a room Right, and we can label it either as a living room or bedroom or kitchen or bathroom and, and so on. Now, if we look into the video, right, what happens in the video, the video, uh, the video offers another dimension, which is the dimension of the time. So, so instead of the information represented by a spatial distribution of X, Y, 
in a video, we have a distribution of X, Y, T, okay, where we have uh, the T in an increasing, increasing direction means we are adding up the multiple frames of the video. Now, why video is important, right? Video is important because video gives you the dynamic information in a sim, right? Image offers a static information, but, but in a real life, right? When you are moving in a traffic area, your, okay, your automated car, right? Requires the video information because it is moving. The, 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 the objects are changing with time, but the image frames are changing with time. In the, in the, in the robotic vision also to, to try to, try to work in a real environment, you have to analyze the video. Sports analytics, which is one of my core domain, I will come to that later in my, in my presentation, right? And obviously in the medical imaging also, nowadays a lot of, lot of uh, video analysis are being done because a lot of non-rigid, non-rigid analysis of the body organs are done, okay? There are a lot of non-rigid body organs, right? To analyze those when you cut the video. So, so in a video, what we try to understand, we try to understand an extra feature, which is a temporal feature, right? And the temporal feature is that how much an object information changes with time, okay? So, so this is a very simple example or a, or a, by which we say that object, object which are located, right, in a particular uh, temporal interval t minus one, and the same objects have shifted, okay, in the time t, right? And this is an extra feature which get added it gets added in a video information, okay? And, and so this feature also we have, to, we have to extract if we are trying to, trying to do the video analysis using our deep networks, right? So, but there are, there are something that, that the information doesn't always changes due to the actual object change, okay? That is the object changes the position. It's not always due to that. The object information can change because there's a change in the brightness. Okay, you have captured the captured the T minus one frame in one particular brightness condition, and you have captured the frame T in the another brightness condition. So then obviously as the brightness values are different, so it will it will find there is a change, a change in the object information with time. But that's not the object doesn't change. It's into the uh, brightness. Okay. We neglect small motion. So, so this we normally neglect, right? We, these are the special cases we have to handle, but, uh, but due to the limitation of time, I'm not getting into those details. Okay, those complex cases here. The other, other assumption is that you have a small motion. You don't, you don't have a very, very large motion because if you have a very, very, very high speed motion, you require number of frames, a more number of frames in a particular video. So normally a video works very fine between 20 frames per second to 35, 30 frames per second. But if you are trying to trying to track an object which is moving very fast, you have to go at least in a 60 frames per second or 80 frames per second. Then the processing processing becomes a very tedious uh, task and there are special techniques to do that, okay? That are, those are also not considered in the normal cases of video analytics, okay? And the spatial coherence, it means that if you are moving an object, the object moves as a whole, okay? It is not that a sort of non-rigid object where the object, one part of the object moves in one direction and another part of the object moves in another direction. So those things are again challenging challenging things, okay? So, so if you look at the data sets, there are a plethora of data sets with which you can work. They are, they are on the normal image, normal videos, sports videos, there are different types of YouTube collection videos, and there are also some videos which are especially for your movie scenes. Okay, and there are plenty of that. You will see that in every, every two months or three months, uh, Okay, researchers uh, make uh, make a data set of the videos and they upload it, okay, for the for the public research for our research purpose, right? And that's a fascinating things to work, okay. So what we will look into here is that it, that was, I will not get into the details of this, but this is a concept called spatio-temporal fusion when we try to do video analytics. Why it is because the spatio means we are doing the image which is a spatial distribution of intensity, right? I is a function of x y. Along with that, we are also taking a temporal path, okay? Because I, X, Y also changes with time, right? And that's, and that's a temporal path. So, so the way we can do is the, is the, okay, is the phenomenal work was first proposed by the uh, 3D convolution. This was a phenomenal work which was published in the IEEE transaction in 2013 where the, where the author said, what is a 3D convolution? So, so what we're doing, the convolution kernels and the, and the, 
the information were all 2D initially. What, when we speak about the CNN, okay, fundamental CNN, it's a two-dimensional. So we try to try to augment that 2D CNN concept by the 3D CNN concept. Where we try to do instead of one one particular image, we put a bunch of images. So what do we have? We have a volume of images. So the kernel which was working on, on a single image will also be a volume kernel. Instead of a two-dimensional kernel, the volume also becomes a three-dimensional kernel, okay? because the other dimension is the time, right? And similarly, all your convolution outcomes are also volume outcomes instead of this, right? And ultimately, we have a number of frames okay, in a temporal domain, which defines the uh, de defines the outcome. So, so if you see that uh, in a particular 3D CNN, you will see there are a lot of in the, in the, the feature space. Feature space is quite extended compared to a 2D CNN, right? And that's one of the one of the cost. Uh, okay, uh, the the issue of the cost which comes in the 3D CNN. Okay. There is also another technique which is called a two two scale convolution model. So, so this follows the principle of our capture what we do through our eyes. So in the eye we have a we have a region called fovea. In the fovea region cap captures the central part of the scene, right? And the rest is called the uh, the okay the context okay which actually takes the everything in the in the particular scene. So. So the central part of the scene has the most important features by which we try to identify the objects, right? And the entire part of the scene actually takes the, takes the average information. So what do we do? We try to take the central part of this, the central part of the frames as one stream, and we take a subsampled, okay? This is a subsampled, uh, uh, subsampled uh, stream of the, of the frames as the other stream. Right, and we try to try to push two networks, right, and try to abstract the features, right, from the from the phobia stream and from the context stream, and ultimately there is a fusion. Where we generate a single feature space coming out from the two feature space, and we try to put the classifier there. Okay. The other important uh, contribution here lies in the in the in the work in two thousand fourteen where they define two separate streams. One is the spatial, one is the temporal. So spatial stream was being taken as a center image given a set of frames. So we try to do the same CNN, okay, of the central frame and try to abstract the spatial features from the particular frame. Whereas the temporal, the temporal stream tries to work on the optical flow information between a multiple stream, a multiple frames which are taken in that particular stream. So there is a spatial flow and the temporal flow, and again the two features from both the temporal and the spatial gets gets fused, and ultimately the classifier can get sort with both the features uh, features uh, the club features, and they can classify it well. Okay, so these are some of the some of the very well defined techniques to handle the video analytics. Okay, though there are many more. Okay, I can I can speak about five, six, seven, eight more. Right. In the, in the latest publications of CVPR and IPCV and the, and the transactions of pattern recognition. I will not continue further due to the limitation of time, right? I can go on and on, but, but what I mean to say is that what's the next level? Okay, the next level is understanding the context, not only understanding the objects in the particular image, uh, okay, in a particular video scene, we are trying to understand the context. The context means that what is the interaction between the two objects in the video? What is the existence of the what? What is the temporal temporal existence of the two objects, right? And and then that will be a sort of a, a sort of cognition, okay, which we can which we can generate through our machine vision. So so correlation between objects and right and trying to and trying to generate the context of the various objects in a given video, right? That's the that's the direction we are moving ahead. Okay, that's very interesting. Some of the interesting works in this direction, okay, is localization, right? You have to, you have to localize, you have to do a co-segmentation co type of approaches in the video, and, and those will lead to this type of extraction of the video data, right? And recent papers on ICCV, CVPR, and transactions, you will see they are moving in this direction, right? You can, you can tell that, oh, this is a sin which is taking, telling about this, or this is a 
scene which is telling about these interactions between the objects. Okay. Now we'll look into, okay, I will just try to motivate you with some of the recent works what we have done, okay, in this particular, and as I said that, uh, though in image, I do a lot of works in medical image processing, but when you look into the video, uh, this is the problem which we are working. We started with the problem of human action recognition, but rather we saw that there are very less amount of work in the, in the, in the sports analytics, okay, implementing, implementing the machine learning and deep learning techniques. So these are the two recent works which we have done. One has been published in the, in the one has been uh, published in the CVPR workshop in 2019, where our group has first proposed okay a particular efficient technique, which is, which is basically a graph network, and then the graph features gets into the, gets into a learning model, right? And 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 this particular network, this particular network, can actually give you the ball position statistics in a soccer game in the real time. We improved our technique, okay, in terms of we made a more, more robust graph, okay, we can now not only can associate the players with the ball, but we can also find the groups of the players, okay, in a particular team, right, and we can try to find that in not only the ball position statistics, but we can also try to find that the positional, positional advantage of a team compared to the to the location of the ball and the and the players of the other team right and this is a very 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 good work which recently got published in the in the pattern recognition journal and 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 this also this also is based on the flow network first we generate a particular dynamic graph and dynamic graph we define the nodes in terms of the players in terms of the of the of the players and the ball and then we try to try to associate the nodes and disassociate the nodes uh, okay, considering whether the ball is being is being coupled with a player, or the ball is in the open space, or the ball is coupled with another another opponent player, or the player of the same particular uh, same particular team. So, depending on where the ball is moving, whether it is in the position of the uh, whether the ball is being uh, pushed for the pass, whether the ball is in the vacant land, or whether the ball is with uh, with another particular position, we try to define the different uh, nomenclature of the nodes and different uh, features gets updated of the nodes, right? And those features of the nodes are being are being used to train a particular network, right? And that network behaves as a classifier. Okay. So these are the good uh, the two works which, if you are interested, uh, to 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 connect with us. Uh, okay, you can surely do that. Right, and in the conclusion, what I can say is that uh, okay, the this is a very interesting domain of of uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning, of course. Okay, so understanding the spatio-temporal information is the key. Uh, there are a lot of activities going on how we can fuse the spatial and the temporal domain information, right, and what that, how we can apply to different domains of applications, right. Obviously, performance versus processing cost is a trade-off. As we know, this is always a, a trade-off in the in the deep learning techniques, right? How much quality I can get, and how much resource I require, how many, whether I can make my uh, model a lot, okay, a lightweight model. People are now trying to trying to work with uh, video analytics, which can be very lightweight. So, so model completion, right? Using the less training data, uh, can we perform something transfer learning type of techniques? So these are. These are all the things which are now coming in a great way in this particular domain so that the performance and the processing cost trade-off can be handled, right? Last but not the least, I just want to tell you that this is, um, this is that as this is an IEEE program, right? That means as, as Professor Selina also knows that I am a very, a very, a very strong volunteer of IEEE in, in, the, in, in my country and also in, the, in Southeast Asia. Uh, this is an IEEE blending learning program, which has been uh, which has been developed by me for IEEE, and this is a machine learning program which will be coming very soon. And I hope that you all will enjoy it once it comes in the IEEE platform. And these are the things which I will be covering, and this will be again coming up with the next uh, uh, okay next stage or the or the next course of deep learning is also on the pipeline. So I hope that IEEE will give me the opportunity to. To work with IEEE and to contribute to the IEEE uh, for the student, for the research communities, and for the professionals in the in the best possible way. And I thank you all, and I thank uh, 
organizers once again, and now I am open for questions, if any. Thank you, sir. Sir, we have two questions in the chat box. So, uh -huh. can I just uh, can I just read out the? Okay, one is uh, if I am not wrong, is it NLP with deep learning sounds interesting? Okay, this is a, a question from Nazneen Akhtar. Okay, okay, yeah, NLP with uh, deep learning is a very important stuff. So NLP nowadays the though. Although this is another domain of work, what I do, I, I okay, I didn't discuss it in this particular lecture uh, because this was a very limited time. Okay, so so there are deep learning models for NLP, right? There are if you if you look into the fundamental models like like RNN and LSTM, uh, but they are now being they are now being heavily dominated by the by the attention and transformer type of techniques, which are which are heavily heavily focused to understand the the named entity, right, and and to and to classify the sentiment of the text. So, so deep learning use of deep learning in NLP is obviously a okay another domain, right, which I didn't touch in this particular in this particular lecture. But this is a very interesting domain. A lot of works are going on. Okay. Uh, there is another question from Mahin. Okay, which one we can choose to detect images of cloud, sky, solar radiation, predict upcoming weather report? Oh, this is a this is again a very interesting question. Okay, though I didn't work in this particular domain, but uh, but what I can perceive is that that means a deep network, right? Deep network works good, right? If you have enough amount of video, okay, amount uh, enough amount of image and video data with their levels, why? Because because you are not supplying the features, right? The filters the filters have to tune themselves to understand the features and abstract the features. So if you don't provide them with enough examples, enough training examples, right? Your, your, your learning will not be very effective, right? Your feature space will be not well built. See, so the, so the basic thing for classifier is building a good feature space, that's all. If you can build a good feature space, your classifier will work. So there are two techniques. One is the traditional machine learning by which you try to you try to generate your techniques for extracting the features from the data be it video or image or audio whatever or text whatever it is you try to define your own own feature extraction procedure and try to and try to generate the feature space in the case of deep learning you don't do that right your your okay your convolution kernels right they try to extract the features and as as this is a supervised learning technique based on your loss function Right, your convolution kernel will get adjusted, right, and try to and try to try to set the weights in such a way features are abstracted in the best possible way so that the uh, so that the classifier works good, okay. And so, in your domain, if you if you can give enough data, right, and if you can define a loss function well, right, it is it is it is very likely that your deep learning technique will work. Sometimes if you don't get a good amount of data to train that there are techniques, okay, like you can, you can use a sort of uh, techniques called where you can generate the data, right, using some, using some GAN type of network, adversary network, you can generate the data, or there are other techniques by which you can generate the data, right, or, or you can use a transfer learning, right, where you, where you, okay, suppose you are the, again, again I give an example of the book, right, Suppose you are trying to learn a very tough book, but before that, your your okay, your teacher or, or supervisor will tell you that okay, first of all, learn the basics, right? And then get into that particular complex book. So, so so what do you do? You can you can learn the basics from a general book, right? And then you can upgrade to that complex concept. So the same thing happens in the transfer learning, right? In the in the case of transfer learning, you take the Take a particular domain where you have enough data, right? And try to understand the basics. Or try to understand the basic features, right? And then with a smaller amount of data, right, you try to just uh, just make it large for the complex domain. And those are the techniques what you can do in the in the in the very critical scenarios of deep learning. Okay, I think I have answered the questions. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.
Now I would like to ask Assistant Professor of IIIT Hyderabad, India, Lalita Kalamani, ma'am, to start her demonstration, and requesting Kitinji Murungi, sir, to be prepared for the next session. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm trying to share my screen soon. Okay. Any problem, Lalita? No, no, no. Uh, no. So can you see my screen? No? Yes. Okay. Fine. All right. Um, let me see if I can go into the full screen mode. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, good afternoon, good evening, and I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. So, if you are across the world, and um, so I'm going to talk about uh, coding theory for uh, various applications. Uh, so this is going to be on communication storage and computing. And uh, in case, uh, you know, because it is mainly towards students, so this is only kind of uh, motivational and uh, perhaps uh, just uh, highlighting the applications. Um, uh, not so much going into detail. Uh, it's only saying that, uh, you know, these kind of research areas exist and um, they're very interesting. Um, okay. Um, I mean, I worked in most of these areas, but um, uh, as I said, I'll only give the problem statement what is uh, going on and uh, perhaps um, uh, tell you what are the breakthroughs which have happened in the past uh, maybe a decade or more, maybe two decades. Okay. Um, yeah, and as you can see, all of these communication storage and computing all are very important applications. Okay, so first we will begin with coding for communication. Uh, so this is uh, just an illustration of a binary symmetric channel. So whenever we talk about communication, there is a channel, uh, there's a transmitter, there's a receiver, and uh, there is a channel uh, between uh, the transmitter and receiver. And the simplest channel that you can think of is binary symmetric channel where uh, I have a, I want to transmit a zero and a one. Okay. And, uh, but um, because the channel is something which introduces noise, uh, the zero and one can, you know, you can get that zero as it is, or there is a certain probability with which it gets flipped. Okay. And that is called P, yeah, that is called the crossover probability. And uh, the it's called a binary symmetric channel because you have as inputs zero and one and uh, the crossover probability is symmetric. So it means that if I transmit a zero um, with the probability P, I get a one. Similarly, if I transmit a one with the probability small P, I get a zero, right? Okay, uh, so what was the breakthrough result in this is uh, what is a term which is known as a channel capacity. So um, this is the image of Claude Shannon, who is, uh, you know, regarded as uh, the father of information theory, and you can say father of more digital communications that way. 
uh the reason being that uh, he came up with um, a particular notion of what is known as channel capacity so this depends only on the channel it doesn't depend on what input you are giving to the channel so for example if i just give you this binary symmetric channel we can determine what is known as channel capacity uh and uh, you can kind of think of it as if it is like how many bits i am able to send through the channel whenever i use the channel once okay and uh, it is as i said it is dependent only on the channel characteristic and uh, a good thing about this channel capacity is that it is a fundamental limit of communication through any channel so which means that uh, i have this particular number and if i somehow transmit at a rate which is below the channel capacity then i'll be able to get the message across with very low probability of error so i'm kind of mentioning a lot of words to you i am just assuming that you know you will be able to make some sense out of it if you have taken a communication course um, a few of these terms do make sense but um, otherwise also i mean colloquially you can understand what probability of error means and so on so that is uh, yeah so if you transmit at a rate below the channel capacity uh then you can get very low probability of error somehow and uh, for any rate above the channel capacity uh no matter what you do uh, you cannot get a probability of error which is small okay so that way it is like saying i i mean uh, you want to achieve this uh, channel capacity somehow you want to transmit at that rate because you want to obviously send more bits through the channel but the channel capacity kinds of gives a fundamental limit you cannot transmit anything above channel capacity okay so uh, what are the breakthroughs in this this so this result itself was known in 1948 in one of the seminal papers which uh, shannon wrote and it is known as the mathematical theory of communication you can look at it uh, it is very i mean it's one of, of course one of the most highly cited papers but then afterwards um you know even for 50 years let's say uh, the researchers were uh, trying to develop codes um uh, which achieve this channel capacity okay? um how come it was not there in the shannon's paper the so shannon's paper actually argued that there exist some random codes okay but random codes are not easy to implement so that is the reason it's like even though he has shown existence of codes which achieve the channel capacity it's still not like a practical result because you cannot implement them okay so then there were two classes of codes which um, kind of uh, get very close to the capacity there's one more class also but these are more recent so that's why i'll just talk about them um one is called the low density parity check codes in short they are also called ldpc codes and the second class of codes are known as polar codes okay both of them go i mean polar codes achieve capacity ldpc codes come very close to capacity okay um again a little bit of history on the discovery of ldpc codes so there's a person known as robert gallagher uh, he is in mit and um, uh, these ldpc codes were discovered in 19, 1960s as itself uh, by robert gallagher in his uh, phd thesis okay and um, i think uh, yeah so at that time it was like more of a theoretical study because whatever codes he had developed right there was uh, not uh, enough uh, hardware okay hardware advancements had, uh, to be able to implement them okay so only in late 90s let's say when another set of codes also became popular and there was advances in hardware these ldpc codes were rediscovered okay so it was lying there in her thesis i mean people did make theoretical advances but never maybe you know gave an attempt to implement them but then in 90s there was renewed interest in these codes and then <clears throat> so yeah so just ignore this parity check matrix low weight code words etc but then the low density parity check means something so the every code has an associated parity check matrix with it and uh, if that is made of somehow sparse kind of entries in particular every row is of low weight then it is called a low density parity check code and um, for applications 
So uh, yeah, so I think this alignment is not great, but LDPC codes are applied. I mean, they have applications in digital video broadcast, ethernet, 5G uh, data channels, all these standards have LDPC codes now as part of them. So you can imagine. So it's like, you know, getting into a standard is a very big thing, uh, let's say for any of these codes. And um, uh, which means that they are actually beating a lot of contenders contender codes and uh, showing good performance and that's the reason they are in the standards okay and uh, one very straightforward reason why they are is um, two reasons one is that uh, they achieve capacity which means they are they achieve in the sense they come very close to the capacity uh, and that is very important because if we uh, some codes are able to operate not able to achieve capacity let's say uh, then uh, we are still off from the optimal right so which means that we are not using the physical channel that we have in a very good way. So, uh, and the second reason why these codes became so popular is that their encoding and decoding complexity is very low, in particular the decoders. Okay. Uh, there is a, a certain algorithm known as belief propagation, and that can be highly parallelized and can be done super fast on, uh, let's say, chips and so on. Okay. Uh, of the order of let's say even uh, they, it kind of operates at uh, 15 mbps and that kind of speeds which is very very hard okay and um, and all these things are scale well okay so even if i pick a code whose length is very large even then all these properties hold for ldpc codes and that is the reason they are very popular okay so that is about the LDPC codes. Then the second set of codes known as polar codes, which were discovered by uh, Professor Erda Larikan from uh, uh, University in uh, Turkey, I guess, Bilkent University, I guess, uh, in 2008. Okay. Um, I mean, why is it even a class apart as opposed to LDPC codes? Both are uh, more or less, you know, they perform very well in practice, but polar codes are also, you know, probably. Uh, capacity achieving, which means you can prove math results with them uh, for binary input memoryless channels. And uh, they do have low encoding, decoding complexities, and so on. So it's like a perfect match of various properties which we want. And, you know, between 2008 and 2019, he has received Shannon Award for his contributions. And uh, Shannon Award is the highest award in information theory society. Okay. And with respect to being in the standards, it's also used in 5G control channel. Okay, so control channel has slightly lesser uh, length of the packets and um, uh, I think uh, that is used. So these are two very uh, codes which have kind of, you know, revolutionized the field of uh, coding for communications. And now it's like point to point communication is very well understood in general. Okay, so that is the uh, application of communication. Uh, the second application I will talk about is coding theory for distributed storage. Um, I mean, I'll give uh, some overview of a system and kind of tell uh, some two sets of codes, just mention them, okay, but they are again, come from very good groups and so on. So this distributed storage system, this is a particular system which, um, you know, what happens is whenever I have a file and you want to store it on a Facebook, uh, no, no, in a Facebook data center or any data center, then it is divided into small blocks and those blocks are randomly placed in what are known as nodes. Okay. And they are placed with a certain replication and uh, by default, the replication factor is three. Um, and uh, these are, I mean, the replication factor kind of gives you the redundancy in case of node failures. Okay. And uh, this kind of thing happens with hundreds of nodes in a Facebook cluster. Actually, there are thousands of nodes. Okay. But then this is actually, if you see the storage overhead that you have is kind of three X, which means that for A, you're storing twice the um, twice more, you are storing 3x the amount of data, and which is generally wasteful if you see the rate at which the data is growing. And uh, in that case, codes become helpful in the case, in the sense that if you see here, you know, you just don't store the replicas, but you store some linear combinations of the packets as well. And uh, uh, here, what I have shown is a code. Um, it's coded data, A, B, C are normal, but this A plus B plus C, actually, if you see it semantically, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. But still, they, it does give the redundancy that you want. And uh, previously, if you see uh, whatever it was giving, like I was storing nine copies, here I'm storing still five, but 
it gives the same amount of you know tolerance to failures as the previous one and that's why these are very popular in the sense that it's very um, you know uh, tolerant to node failures but then there have been two classes of course recently if, uh, which uh, wanted efficient repair properties also so repair is a slightly orthogonal direction as compared to the storage overhead and uh, there were two classes of codes uh, one uh, was called regenerating codes this uh, came from a group in berkeley and uh, there's another codes called codes with locality which uh, came from microsoft research and uh, these are just illustrations of some codes i mean the way they are stored etc i will not expect you to understand that but uh, the way it is is uh, in one case you know efficient repair is accomplished by minimizing the repair bandwidth itself in another case by uh, minimizing the number of nodes accessed and these two codes kind of uh, came around 2010 a little before and after kind of and uh, there's been a lot of research uh, in, uh, with respect to constructing these codes proving properties with respect to these codes in the last um, uh, eight years or more okay uh, so that's what has been happening and um, not that they are just in theory they have also been uh, used in practice because as I said, one of the codes, the codes with locality, which are also known as LRC here, locally repairable codes, they were originated in Microsoft Research. So they have, you know, um, a clean way to kind of deploy their solutions as well. And uh, it has been deployed in Azure storage, Windows servers, uh, and so on. Okay, so this, uh, um, and similarly, They've also been in, so this is like um, enterprise versions, right? But uh, even in open source kind of systems like uh, HDFS, which is Hadoop distributed file system and Ceph as well, uh, these codes have been implemented, okay? So that is with respect to codes for storage. The last topic, which I'll just touch upon very briefly uh, is codes for distributed computing. Uh, here, the problem setup is again, slightly different. And since um, we look at distributed computing applications, any of the machine learning applications which run divide their job into to run on um, several nodes okay and uh, this is just a framework where there is a master and there are all these worker nodes the master kind of divides the jobs and gives them to the worker nodes and the worker nodes send their outputs and the master somehow aggregates these outputs in order to accomplish the task whatever it is it could be a simple gradient descent or you know, matrix multiplication or several things like this, okay? But then what is uh, known is that uh, there is something known as straggler problem, which means that there will be some slow nodes in the system. And um, uh, if you are just plainly dividing it, then uh, it's like, you know, the master has to wait for all the nodes and the slow nodes are the ones which form the bottleneck with respect to finishing the jobs, okay? And um, this is just a curve which shows, you know, that um, out of some number of workers, some, I mean, a fraction of them will be very slow in general, okay? So, which means that they will kind of form a bottleneck for you in order to, uh, when you try to um, compute the job execution times. So, then what is the solution to that is introducing redundancy. Again, one way of introducing redundancy is just to replicate. But um, wherever there is replication, uh, there will be a better way of uh, introducing redundancy and coding has been used for, you know, distributed matrix multiplication, gradient descent, polynomial evaluations, etc. Okay, so all this is very, very recent work and, um, you know, there were many, in all the work that I've described, there are many award winning papers and uh, information series society and you know, it has gone all the way to practice. So these are the applications of coding theory, which I wanted to say and I've worked in um, more or less all the applications I and mean, more in storage and computing but recently i'm doing work in communications as well okay so with that i would like to conclude and i'll be happy to take questions thank you ma'am for your informative session now i would like to request the director of school of information technology at university of In, at this moment, I would like to call Chair of IEEE Photonics Society Chapter and IEEE Young Professional at Kenya Section and the founder of CAMS Hub, Kithinji Muriungi Sir, to start his session and requesting Dr. Ismail Ashekji Sir to look for the next session.
Okay, thank you uh, very much. And I hope you can hear me. Yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, so let me share my screen and kindly confirm that it's visible uh, on your end. Yes, sir, your screen is visible. Okay, thank you. Uh, so when, my name is Kitinji Muriungi from Kenya and uh, I wear different arts. During the day, I'm a systems engineer at uh, Konza, smart city, popularly known as uh, Konza Technopolis. And uh, during my part-time, uh, I work uh, at a startup called Kamsab that we are currently working on uh, as a platform recently. And apart from that, during my part-time and during my free time, I like to volunteer uh, at IEEE. So basically in those three areas, that is where you will find uh, most of my time being spent, uh, either professionally, career-wise, personally, or even at some point with friends and families uh, still working on the same stuff. And today, uh, great thanks and uh, to uh, Tabil uh, Hamed, who really uh, reached out to me and requested me to, to, to share in this uh, uh, summit. And I'm really grateful because I think when we talk about uh, talents and future, this is where uh, great stuff happen. So, um, on behalf of uh, IEEE uh, Photonic Society, I'll be presenting the topic, uh, talking about photonics, emerging technologies, and other stuff. But on behalf of young professionals, IEEE Kenya and IEEE Young Professionals globally, I'll be showing uh, how different generations have really worked on whatever I'm presenting here, where students, professionals, young professionals have worked together from 2018 up to date, from uh, inception of a project to presentation of that project into the defense, and later into presenting the, the, the paper, the initial paper into uh, one of the greatest uh, 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 conference in IEEE Photonics. I hope you'll enjoy and uh, let's keep the ball rolling. Uh, so before I, I, I proceed further, I think it's always nice, especially for those people who have never been in Africa, and now we are talking about defense. And uh, maybe there are those ones who have this perception that uh, I know this guy will kind of mention the bows and arrows, eh? uh, but I think uh, that has uh, gone beyond the times. Uh, it has been used over 100 years or 50 years. Uh, but more importantly, the current technologies that we'll be talking about is, is something interesting. And, uh, and maybe for those of us who have never visited Africa, they always think of big five. Eh? We are here in tech, but uh, there are still those people when they hear of Africa, they think of uh, the big five. And still there are those ones uh, with, with that mind of uh, help Africa and there is drought and all this stuff. And uh, today we are not talking about that. Neither are we talking about uh, tech import uh, that most of the importation that we have done in Africa, but, but I will be, diving deeper into something different, uh, retelling the story of Africa in something interesting that maybe majority of us don't know. I know so many of us, when we talk about drones, we understand, uh, or rather we know about the biggest brand in the world, that is Zipline, that has been celebrated all over the world. You go to US, you go to Asia, you go to uh, Europe, everybody, uh, when, when they mention about drones and, uh, medical uh, applications, they, they have at some point, uh, they have to mention um, Zipline. And, uh, and I think uh, it's not exception for me when I'm also talking about drones uh, in an African setting, not to mention this because in one or the other way, it's kind of linked to our agenda today. And uh, more than that, I think it's always important to appreciate that uh, uh, drones, unlike any other technology, they are not really taking up fast because of so many uh, regulations. Uh, we call them, uh, they, they, are, they, are, they are quite a lot. Name them uh, 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 like restrictions, bans, uh, effective bans, uh, but, but there are those uh, others at least with some unrestricted uh, in terms of drones like, uh, like Chad. But still there are those ones who have no, no whatsoever any regulation when, when it comes to matters to do with drones. 
And uh, Kenya, uh, I think we, 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 are, we are still in the right track because at the moment we, we, we have an effective ban, uh, but this effective ban, you will, you, you will see in later slides how we've been able to tweak that ban to make it effective, especially when we're talking about research and uh, uh, these kind of innovations. Uh, so when we look into uh, the pro projections here, I think it's it goes without saying that Africa we are really left behind because even the numbers themselves can say that uh, we, we are really very far uh, with with continents like Asia where they are doing projections of 18.4 billion in Africa we are doing uh, 0 0.9 billion uh, or or else or else less than one billion uh, which is expected in um, in the next uh, three years or so. Uh, but again, uh, apart from that, uh, truth be told that at least there is that essence of growth. We are seeing growth, even if it's very little uh, or even if it's very small. And that is what is really commendable because within five years, we can see the numbers will have doubled. I think that is what really matters, the progress uh, rather than uh, stagnation. Still looking deeper into the, the drones pandemic and the response that we've seen, uh, there's, there has been quite a lot of uh, growth, uh, especially in, in specific areas. Uh, when we talk about hardware, there has been quite a lot of growth. But again, in software, there is kind of stagnation there. But when we talk about services, this is where uh, maybe delivery uh, uh, or maybe some kind of uh, remodernization or, or of some services, we are seeing that kind of uh, growth. And this has really been enhanced and facilitated by the pandemic because uh, remote uh, or rather remotization has really been the order of the day. But more importantly, uh, let me try to zoom closer and uh, bring you back home. Uh, this is Uganda, where you will find uh, uh, in most cases, I grew up in this kind of environment where at some point you are forced to forego your education so that you can take guard of uh, the animals or the, the crops so that uh, to protect them from animals. And uh, this may not really be a, a problem to, to some kid who has been raised in New York town or New York city, or maybe a very big city in Asia or Europe. But trust you me, this is the kind of challenges that uh, most of Africans really face, especially students in Africa. And, and, and most of these, uh, kids are really brilliant in one or the other ways. And uh, in this kind of a way, we are trying to look into how can we really uh, use these kind of technologies that we have. Now we are talking about artificial intelligence. How can we be able to use that kind of technology uh, with the help of drones and now bring in better camera, better visuals and better eyes from the sky so that we are able to, to, to bring this kid out of the, 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 uh, the, the farms so that they can go to school and leave the drones and the technology do their work. And uh, that is just an example. But again, when we look into uh, the, the, the terrorism and such kind of stuff, I think uh, all of us know that being in the, in, in the borders where we are bordering Somalia, which has always been in war and terror attacks and uh, all that, there is, uh, there, there is really a need to, to, to prevent, to detect, and maybe to deny access or rather to respond effectively. And all these uh, are being uh, putting drones into resilience of fighting these kind of uh, uh, problems. But again, uh, how are all these maybe linked into the kind of solutions that we are looking into? Because we're talking about photonics, where we are bringing in high, uh, powerful cameras and sensors, but again, uh, being able to bring all this together so that we are able maybe to, to get to understand uh, about uh, different scenarios that uh, we may face, especially maybe in a scenario where someone is lost or maybe where we are doing uh, some kind of detection and um, we need uh, this kind of search to be very accurate. But more than that, uh, this is a very important uh, aspect and concept that uh, we looked into uh, landmine detection. And that's where our, our research uh, 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 started back in 2018. And it has grown up to date uh, through this kind of enthusiasm and trying to see how far we can go with drones. More importantly, 
Uh, apart from uh, the normal, uh, I think on the back side here, on the lower end, you can see where uh, there are these uh, uh, Kenyan uh, army who are being trained on how to detonate these and detect them. But now uh, the idea that we came up with, apart from using people uh, to map, to detect and to detonate, how about now we bring in drones, but now these drones uh, are able to do all this in a high scanning speed inspection of areas and uh, and at some point increase safety because again losing a person uh, cannot be equated uh, uh, into even losing a drone that is worth even uh, hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars and uh, of course we have seen most of these things uh, uh, being uh, uh, employed in the recent crisis uh, locally here uh, this is one of the best cases that we saw in in uh, in Kenya, uh, trying to do the the policing uh, and especially uh, crack down of trespassers because uh, police uh, at some point uh, they they have to put these barriers. Uh, but again, there were those people who thought that they could really go beyond them and uh, trespass. Uh, apart from that, we have seen some very good uh, uh, application of this in South Africa. Uh, still the same in um, uh, transfer knowledge. And again, I had to put this kind of uh, knowledge uh, transfer training and capacity building because uh, the, the nature into which this project uh, originated uh, at the time I was in school and now that I'm a young professional and we are still working with the students that I left in school is because of this kind of knowledge transfer training and capacity building because uh, 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 let truth be told that in Africa and maybe in most other parts of the world, uh, we, we don't have really capacity into people that who can really do uh, most of this work uh, locally. And that is one of the, the key things that we are looking into, especially in Kenya and in Africa. Um, of course, apart from building capacity, we have seen some good initiatives uh, by the government and, and also by individuals. Uh, this is an example of Uganda and the government of uh, Nigeria. But more importantly, uh, I, I always like mentioning this. This, uh, this took place last year, uh, where there is an initiative by the Kenya government, uh, led by the, His Excellency, the President of Kenya, uh, Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta, uh, to, 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 equip, to equip military and even individual researchers so that they can build Kenya by Kenyans. So the, the, the whole agenda here was to try and bring out drones, technologies, and uh, try to bring in all these imaging processing uh, tools and uh, platforms and solutions so that uh, these solutions are not only built to serve Kenyans, but they are, all, they are also built by Kenyans themselves. And more importantly, uh, of course, whenever we talk about all these uh, stuff, about drones and about uh, most of these technologies, uh, uh, especially when we mention at some point AI, we, we bring in a high level of uh, policies. Uh, and with these policies, uh, partnership is really essential. But again, we, we, are, we are seeing uh, quite a lot of, um, a lot of uh, forums, especially in Africa, uh, where Rwanda is taking lead into trying to bring partners together and talk about policies and try to see how well can these policies really be, uh, be brought into, into use so that uh, entrepreneurs, innovators, and maybe researchers can really take advantage of, uh, of these technologies and not only use them uh, maybe for the res uh, research purposes, but also build them so that they can solve real uh, African or rather real world problems. And of course, talking about such kind of forums, we, we, we cannot fail to mention innovations and, and entrepreneurship. And apart from the, the nature into which we are seeing all these kind of uh, uh, problems and uh, all these policies and all these bans, uh, we are still seeing quite a lot of uh, drone ventures and uh, highly technological kind of ventures, which are really bringing in solutions encompassed by drones, that is number one, and uh, photonics uh, in terms of uh, very sophisticated and complex and accurate and precise sensing me mechanism. And also at some point also bringing in other technologies. Like of course, whenever you bring all these uh, sensing mechanism, uh, 
uh, you can't fail to bring I in IoT and AI into, into play. And this is very important because of what we have been seeing, especially in Africa. When we talk about all these innovation cycles, most of these, and not, not even most of these, uh, I think uh, the bigger portion of it, uh, especially in Africa, we've really missed out of them. And now we are trying at least to pick up into the area in which we have a plain uh, level ground where all of us can really struggle and uh, uh, take a lead or rather take a leap into, into this kind of technology. And of course we are seeing different waves, like currently we are kind of uh, going past the fifth wave where we've really been seeing digital networks uh, taking over. Like the leading companies right now is, is in the space of uh, uh, software, uh, new media and digital networks. Let's talk of Google, let's talk of Facebook, uh, let's talk of any other. Whenever you mention all these social media kind of networks, they are really taking lead. And uh, this is where now engineering engineers are really being bugged into these kind of uh, problems because uh, maybe we are not seeing real engineering companies taking lead, but I think I'm really happy to see uh, in the, the previous days that we are seeing Teslas and uh, SpaceX really taking lead uh, in combining even Google and Facebook. And that is why when we talk about sixth wave, we are seeing this is where now that the real engineers are winning, the guys who are doing AI, the guys who are doing IoT, the robotics guys, and now the, the drones are really winning. And we, when we talk about clean tech, we are talking about uh, be it renewable, uh, be it all these kind of uh, maybe energy and, uh, and all that stuff. That is where now the, the, the next wave we are looking into all these stuff winning. Uh, of course, uh, there, there's quite a lot of restrictions when we talk about matters to do with the drones and not only drones, but uh, whenever we talk about things that can really be uh, taken advantage of, in, 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 uh, especially when they land into the wrong hands. And uh, this is uh, the, the, uh, the, the license I got in 2018, uh, to do, uh, 2019 rather, to do a project. And that project, uh, apart from it being my final year project, it was really uh, a very good platform because we pioneered a, a, a drone kind of uh, revolution, where apart from us doing it in school and doing it in our boardroom, it exploded to a point that we were invited by the military so that we could really work with them. And uh, apart from working with them, we also had an opportunity where we even showcased uh, the solutions that we had developed for them. And uh, this, was, uh, this was one of those solutions. I think due to time, I will not really play this, but uh, if you want to, uh, to see the, the short video due to security reasons, you can, uh, you can see it in, uh, in, 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 the, in, in my YouTube channel. And apart from this initiative that started in 2018, we did the presentation in 2019, and uh, 2020 Corona COVID came, and 2021 we've finally published a paper, uh, the first round of uh, paper really trying to uh, push this research uh, forward and uh, making sure at least we, we are making progress into whatever we are really doing. And um, other than that, this is the team that I'll, I've always uh, kept close into my heart from school and now that we are young professionals. Uh, uh, we have the three young professionals here, myself and uh, Elvis Odwar. And George Mwenda is uh, the cadet, or rather he's currently in the army as a specialist who has really helped us into shaping and uh, bringing more light into the space, uh, the, the space of uh, defense and security. Of course, there are matters that uh, as civilians we are not supposed to handle. And that's where he was coming in. Alan Kimeli, uh, Bernard, Beryl, and Chris, and Samia, these are students from Moi. Uh, some of them will be graduating in the next one year or two. And uh, we have always had held these students as young professionals, uh, the three of us, not only to show them the way, but also to show them that uh, it's always good to keep doing whatever you are doing if it's something that is really of interest. And remember the, what IEEE really uh, talks about, advancing technology for humanity. So as a student, you should not just do a research or rather do a project. And when you leave school, uh, uh, that, that research is, is really an end of it. You can, you can still proceed. You can still continue doing your work. And uh, that is where the beauty of technology and the beauty of helping people really 
uh, comes into play. Uh, I, I, uh, that uh, is my final uh, take and my final word. And I'll say thank you very much for the honors into sharing uh, this presentation. Uh, back to you, uh, presenter. And uh, welcome to answer two or three of your questions. Thank you so much. That was a very informative session. Thank you for sharing uh, your information. I'm hoping uh, to I answering just... any question. I don't know if there's any question uh, in particular that I can respond to, uh, Amira. Um, I don't see any question in the chat box. Uh, if anyone have any question, please uh, feel free to ask. Okay, interesting. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I believe uh, that should be the end of my presentation. And uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity and allowing me to present these to you. Thank you very much. And bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Now I request uh, 2021 JCI Mauritius Judy Chairperson, Senior Engineer, Meta Coach Certified, and John C. Maxwell Coach, Trainer, and Speaker, Dr. Smile Serge Sir to start his demonstration. And also requesting Chaudhuri Adha Mahmood sir to be ready for the next session. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, like all the organizers. Thank you, MC. Hopefully you can see me and hear me properly. You can see my slide. And thank you, Tabil, for making the connection and inviting me to this conference. So I'm Dr. Smile. So we are going to change field like drastically we are leaving the earth we are going to the moon because we are going to talk about personal development and growth and we are going to see how it's linked to engineering that you are doing so if you are ready a few words about me i'm a practicing engineer at the only electricity board okay in mauritius and but basically and uh, ultimately like Secondly, I'm also a coach in personal development, in grooming people, in leadership as well. And as, as far as IEEE is concerned, I've been a member for the past 10 years or more, and I'm a senior member as from, I think, last year. So where is it? I'm from Mauritius. So where is Mauritius? It's in the Indian Ocean, very small island. There you go. You can, you can Google it later afterwards. How it looks like, this is maybe a few pictures about how it's going to look like. Mauritius, the population and how the how wide is the country very small country but they like a very welcoming population so let's get started with a few questions to because you're not going to listen you're going to have a few questions to answer now okay question for you and i understand that the organizers have already some gift for you maybe a check ready for you if you get this one right so who is responsible for your success you have four answers a the government b the economy c your boss D is your parent. Oh, okay, you can use a lifeline. Okay, 50-50 for a friend or uh, you can ask the audience. So who is responsible for your success? You can, you can put the answer in the chat. I'm going to have a look at it ultimately due to time. So basically, it's none of these answers. So you are responsible for your own success. You are responsible for your own success. What does that mean? So personal development is a belief that you are worth the effort, the time, and the energy needed to develop yourself. So you are important. You are a worthy human being that you need to change your life. Why change your life? Else is going to be someone else who is going to, to do like a career map for you. You need to trace your own career map by indulging, by getting into personal development. Now, next question for you, question number two. Okay, so you have 85% and then 15%. Which one, according to you, is going to represent the success? Okay, the part of success in your life. It can be in your career and so on. So which one? Most likely you would say 85% on what I'm learning at the university and so on. 15% maybe a bit of soft skills, isn't it? 
But let's see what research have shown us. So what are so important about soft skills? Research conducted by the Harvard University and Carnegie Foundation showed that 85% of job success, if you are looking for job success, 85% of this success come from soft skills and not necessarily from the hard skills. The technical skills are good, the engineering skills you are learning are fantastic, but then you will need much more of soft skills. You will need to develop your personality. This is what we are going to talk about today. So you need to understand where you are today, where you want to be in the future. Do you have a desired state? And from there, you look for the gap. What is a gap? That's what you call a gap analysis. So we can work on that. We are going to create an action plan. Like if I tell you, eat a big chunk of cheese. You won't be able to just eat the cheese as a big chunk like that. You will need to split it into smaller pieces. From then on, you can eat small pieces and you can complete ultimately the big chunk of cheese. The same is going to be true when you're going to, to move from one level to the next level. But you need to be intentional about this growth. We have around maybe 100 people listening at the beginning of this presentation. But only, let me tell you, it's sad reality only 2% of people are really going to look into personal development. 98% are going to say, okay, but I'm happy as I am. I'm in my comfort zone. It's not me who is telling, who is telling you that. It's the, uh, what we have from research, okay? What we have seen, I've seen from the past five to six years, while I'm teaching, I'm mentoring people, only 2% will say, okay, I think I need to go to the next level. And I need to trace, I need to prepare my future, the way I'm, I'm looking at it, how I want it to be. And you can do it if you decide to move out of the comfort zone. A ship in harbor is safe. You will say, okay, but I'm safe, I'm comfortable. But this is what ships are, are made for. Are ships made to stay safe in the harbor or are they required to go into the deep sea where there are storms, there are rains, there are heavy, uh, maybe uh, stuff around there. They can be maybe damaged and so on, but ultimately is what ships are made for. So you need to leave this comfort zone and go and chase your destiny, chase your career. That's what you call the law of intentionality. You need to be aware first, and then you need to be intentional about growth. It's not like you are a plant. Okay, maybe physically you're going to grow. I'm going to be 12 years old, 25 years old, and so on, 40 years old, ultimately, and so on. No, it's about personal growth. How is your mindset change? What is your perception of life? Are you living your purpose? What is your purpose in life? This is what personal growth is all about. And it is intentional. It doesn't just happen by chance. Oops, oh, magic. And it just happened. No, it is intentional. So you will need to decide. I don't know when. I give you up to tomorrow morning, maybe overnight to think about it. But you need to be intentional about your growth. Believe me. I know this is being recorded. So I give you the guarantee that if you get into personal development, personal growth, your life is going to change. And I mean it. I give you the guarantee for that. So why? For things to change, you answered it previously, most likely. You have to change. Your success depends on you. For things to get better, you have to get better. For things to improve, you have to improve. This is from one of my mentors, Jim Ron. Okay, so Google him, look for him on YouTube. You have lots of interesting videos. And believe me, this is quite some big stuff that you are going to hear. Now you are engineers and you like mathematics. Okay, maybe what is Ismail telling you about? Is he like really into personal development? Or our life going to change? Let's have, let's show it to you mathematically. If you take one, okay, so you are operating where you are nowadays, okay, on the same level, and you operate similarly for 365 days over one year. At the end of the year, 31st of December, you are going to remain the same, 1.00. However, if you decide to say, okay, I'm going to maybe do slightly less today. Let's say 0 0.99, only 1% less. So over 365 days, ultimately at the end of the year, you are going to become 0 0.03, what you were at the beginning of the year. But now if you decide, okay, I'm going to make 1%, you're not asking you for 10%, 20%, 25%, 1% change in your life every day. Read one additional page of personal development. Listen to a YouTube video on personal development. Listen to Jim Rohn, okay? And I have a lot of videos on my YouTube channel. Listen for only five minutes, 10 minutes per day. But over 365 days, 
just check what you will be at the end of the year. This is only one year. Imagine if you compound that over several years. This is what we call daily, small daily improvement compounded over time. It's not only one day you say 50% per day. No, it's daily improvement compounded over time. So why not wait till the end of the month and say, okay, I'm going to brush my teeth 60 times in one day. Is it the same as every day, morning, and in the evening you're going to brush your teeth? Not. So that is what we call the compounding effect. Okay, now to, to get started, you need to set a goal. What do you want to be in the future? In the next two years, five years, 10 years, what do you want to be? Why is it so important? Because you want to have your ladder against a correct wall. Else you are going to climb, readily climbing up, and then you see ultimately after 10 years, okay, I've been leaning against the wrong wall. So just check why. Right now you start thinking about what is my goal, and I need to set my goal for the next five, 10 years. So people who set goals are 10%, not 10%, but 10 times more successful than those who don't. 10 times more successful. What? So there are studies who have shown that some people have New Year's resolution. I want to lose weight and so on during the New Year. This is a resolution, but it is shown that as at 14 February, 80% of these resolutions have already failed. That at St. Valentine's Day, the resolution has already failed. But set goals this is not goals, this is resolution. We are talking about written goals, goal setting exercise. There is an experiment which has been conducted, okay, where two uh, pots, okay, two containers having seed. One, they have seeds with, uh, they have written love, another one with anger. And every day, a student was, was, they were putting that in two places on the, on the table, same amount of sunlight, same amount of water, whatever. And every day for a couple of weeks, they were telling on one, love, very good words, and so on. On the other one, it was anger, you look dirty, and, 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 and so on. So what happened at the end of like one week or so? Oh, two weeks. This is what happened. The one which, which was showered with love, words, and so on, started to sprout, grow healthily. The one which was like they were shouting angry words, like not so interesting word to do it. Just have a look at what happened. The same environment, like sunlight, water, and so on, but only the, the power of words. So you need to choose to choose in which environment you are working on. Due to time, I, I won't be able to give you all the tips, but at least one, at least one. Choose your environment. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Again, this is from Jim Rohn, one of my mentors. So choose who is part of your inner circle. Who is your five person that you spend the most time with? And if you change it, if you say, okay, this one I need to change because this is where I know I want to be, and you're going to change. Your average is going to change and you're going to go up to the next level. So that was it for me. I was given 10 minutes. Hopefully I've been able to trigger. My aim was to trigger this need, this like awareness for you to go, to read, okay, to get into personal development. So I can be reached. You can contact me on my website. You have my email address. I'll be so happy to maybe take up your question, your personal question as well. You can contact me. And again, I'm so thankful. Okay, I, I didn't talk about engineering, but it is so important, as important, but for me, it is more important. This is what changed my life ultimately as an engineer. So nowadays I'm most into mentoring. I'm still working as an engineer in transmission line project, but I'm a lot into mentoring, like people around me, people in Mauritius, across Africa to change, okay? With what we call personal development and growth. So that was it from me. Thank you organizers. And I'm going to take any questions that you have in the chat box. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, you can write them in the chat box. Okay, no questions. Thank you, sir, for sharing with us your elegant demonstration. It was very informative and interesting session. Dear audience, uh, we are again going for a photo session now. Please turn on your camera. Everyone, please.
Hello, am I audible? Okay, I think it is done. At this moment in time, I kindly request the robotics, robotics instructor of Punjab group of colleges, Rahul Session, Chaudhary Athar Mehmood sir, to commence this session and also requesting Nazin Akhtar ma'am to get ready for the next session. Hello everyone. I'm audible to all of you. Yes, sir. Hello. You're audible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, IEEE BUBT student branch uh, for inviting me and uh, for arranging an amazing virtual summit. And uh, congratulations to all the organizers, all the collaborating branches, the student branches for arranging a successful virtual summit. So uh, this is Chaudhary Atar Mahmood working as a robotics instructor at Punjab Colleges Lahore in Pakistan. And I'm also former chairperson of IEEE Comsats University Islamabad student branch. Uh, moreover, uh, right, currently I'm serving as IEEE PESC SEC Pakistan. Uh, we know that the, we have very limited time and the students are already and it's already too late. So I will not take uh, uh, more time. So let's start the discussion here. It is very important. Uh, please make sure the slides are visible. Yes, sir, it is visible. Okay, thank you. So it's, it is very important to uh, discuss about industry 4.0. Uh, if we talk about Industry 1.0 revolution, uh, at that time we have mechanical uh, engines, steam engines, powered and uh, looms. And if we talk about Industry 2.0, at that time we have mass production, assembly line, electrical engines, energy. And if we talk about Industry 3.0, at that time we have automation, computers, and electronics. But if we talk about Industry 4.0, it's a bit different. We have IoT, Internet of Things, cloud computing, advanced algorithms, artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, big data, smart sensors, predictive maintenance. All these are very important and these, and these all these technologies are playing a very important role in developing advanced robots, right? So uh, first of all, uh, it's a very simple question and a very simple answer. What is a robot? A robot is an autonomous system which exists or interacts with the physical world and can sense, think, and act to achieve some goals, right? So there's another question. What is robotics? Robotics is an interdisciplinary field that sits at the crux of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and computer science. Robotics professionals not only apply their knowledge and skills from all three disciplines to develop robots, but also study human factors to enable the adoption of robotic technologies in a wide variety of applications ranging from healthcare to manufacturing to exploration. There are a huge, there are many uh, uh, applications I will discuss inshallah. So if we talk about uh, the uh, applications, there are security, space exploration, entertainment, agriculture, healthcare, underwater exploration, food preparation, manufacturing, industrial automation, military, and customer services. So there is a question, uh, what, are, uh, what are the security applications and uh, uh, what are the space exploration and how robotics is working in security and all these aspects. So uh, let's uh, let's come to the point. Just a minute. Uh, is it visible, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
For example, if we talk about industrial automation, uh, there are arc welding, spot welding, materials handling, machine trending, painting, packing, assembly, mechanical cutting, grinding, and all. So uh, if, uh, if we talk about a particular arc welding, one of the driving force of switching to robot welding is improving the safety of workers from arc one. So if we talk about spot welding, spot welding joins two contacting metals surfaces by directing a large current through the spot. If we talk about materials handling, uh, material handling robots are utilized to move back and select products. They also can automate functions involved in transferring of part from one piece to of equipment to another. Direct labor costs are reduced. So these are the perks of uh, automation. If we talk about machine tending, robotic automation of machine tending is the process of loading and unloading raw material into machinery as it's very difficult if we uh, if we hire some uh, person sorry to interrupt hire person. Had, uh, sir have you changed your slide uh, no actually i have removed the slides because we have very limited time and uh, it's already too late the participants are leaving so i decided to reduce my slides i will just uh, on. okay sir you can go on industries at it increases the quality and consistency of the product so these are the perks i don't want to go into the technical details of uh, these things i just want to let you know about the applications of robotics as i mentioned security space exploration entertainment agriculture if we if we if we explore robotics it's it's all about uh, all about um, everywhere around us uh, the microwave we are using, the refrigerator we are using at our homes. Um, uh, you can say uh, the air conditioner you are using at your homes, uh, the, the automated cars. There are so many things you are using and these are all robots. So uh, if we talk about uh, the carrier of robotics, sorry. It's not about only for the electrical engineers, design engineer, software engineer, hardware engineer, user experience, data scientist, machine learning engineer, algorithm engineer. So it means uh, we need all type of engineers to develop these uh, to develop robots. Top seven carriers in robotics. Robotics is a very interdisciplinary field and robots are tightly integrated systems actually. So for this reason, there's an array of neat carriers that fall under the, uh, you can say, general umbrella of robotics, each of which contributes to develop uh, development of autonomous machines, you can say. So if we talk about uh, specifically enge uh, design engineer, so the design engineer creates the visual looks for a robot they often stay by sketching schematics or figures of robots and they design different kind of robots, the mechanical designs, mechanical engineering team to ensure these plans are followed correctly during the development of robots, right? If we talk about software engineers, they are also playing a very vital role in robotics. Software engineers in robotics are a change of developing the software that allows each machine to function basically uh, you know very well uh, they allows each machine to function they work closely with the software designs and programmers to integrate uh, you can say new software with existing systems and typically remain involved without the robots construction to ensure full functionality uh, to be achieved uh, if we have uh, um, if we have if we have goals to uh, achieve some particular goals and uh, we are designing a, a particular robot so the software engineer must work on these goals and uh, to achieve these goals right in robotics uh, you can say software engineers are also uh, tasked with staying up to date with changing technologies as well 
And uh, if we talk about the hardware engineer, uh, a hardware engineer is responsible for the computer hardware that uh, robots utilize to function, basically. They can have a hand in everything from, from prototyping and to development and then often task without overseeing the execution of a hardware build. Once a robot has been constructed, a hardware engineer may also pack it with testing and analysis of the design system and lead the team in making any necessary changes for the improvement. So this is the basic working uh, of an hardware engineer in robotics field. And if we, uh, if we talk about uh, user experience UX designer, uh, they are very popular nowadays. Uh, the work of a UX de designer uh, in uh, in an aspect of robotics, uh, we consider integral but often underrepresented in the large robotics field. When building a robot, sometimes engineers can overlook what the user needs. Basically, he explains, identify that it's up to the UX designer to present this perspective in the development process because it's totally dependent, dependent on the UX designer, right? So if we talk about data scientists, uh, uh, as almost uh, robots run on data, the work of data scientists is critical uh, within the robotics field. Why? Because these professionals are responsible for designing the data, modeling, processing, and creating the algorithms and predictive models on which the data is gathering and interpreted. They also analyze data set on which existing robots function, make adjustments to collect, process, or storage systems, and uh, measure effectiveness in order to improve functionality of robots. So data scientists are playing also a vital role in uh, making advanced robots. So every, every post has its own worth uh, if we talk about machine learning engineers, uh, machine learning engineers are responsible for the automation of aspects of robotics. Uh, these professionals rely on data predictive analysis. Uh, in many cases, they use advanced software to automate predictive models as a way of advancing the machine function and helping it from the experiences. So machine learning engineers are often highly skilled in data science, deep learning, neural, natural language, processing and programming and more and more. So everyone is playing their role very effectively. And uh, if we talk about algorithm engineers, you, you can understand very easily uh, in the scope of robotics and algorithm engineer main role is to research, develop and then test the algorithm on which robot runs, right? These professionals work closely with the rest of development team to understand the desired functionality of the robot, the identify and then integrate the data and then and they need to reach the that particular goals which are selected, which are set by, uh, by the owner of uh, a company, by the, uh, by the person who is making the robot Right. So these are the uh, carrier, these are the carriers in robotics, and uh, uh, all those who are software engineers, machine learning engineers, algorithm engineers, data scientists, user experience-wise, UX designer, designers, they can uh, they, they can uh, collaborate with each other and make amazing robots in the field of robotics. Right. So uh, it's very important uh, to uh, let me change the slide. Setting yourself up for a successful career in robotics. Uh, there are three things. One, develop the necessary skill set. This is very and the most important thing. The second thing is to obtain hands-on experience, which is also very important. And the third one is earn a master's in robotics, but it's not compulsory for some up to some extent, you can say. Professionally looking uh, to work in the robotics field must obtain the unique skill set experience and advanced training required to these niche roles. 
uh, if we talk about develop the necessary skill set, what are these skill sets we need? Despite the trail skill set of each individual career path, there's a common toolkit of practical and soft skills. All advanced robotics professionals here, and you can access it. Uh, the practical skills typically span the wide scope of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and computer sciences, electronics as well. So as such, um, we can say he identifies that most robotics should be comfortable programming, right? And coding complex systems as well as building and working with the software and hardware ranging from different design sensors to actuators, which detects the, the uh, which uh, perceives data from the environment and all, right? So uh, this is very important. If we talk about uh, obtaining hands-on experience, this is uh, another important aspect. So uh, these are uh, very important aspects of uh, setting yourself up to for a successful career in robotics. Uh, I'm not going into the technical details. There are many other uh, robotics uh, um, aspects like agriculture robots, humanoid robots, um, there are so many applications and we, we are even using the robots um, in our daily life. So uh, it's, a, it's a very vast topic, but I don't want to take more time because it's already too late. Uh, thank you for listening and bearing me quietly. Uh, if you have any question, please ask in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your interesting session about robotics. And you, uh, if you have any question, please uh, write in chat box. At this stage, I would like to ask the chair of IEEE Photonic Society and IEEE Sensor Council, Miami section, joint chapter and IEEE Photonic Society 2021 graduate student scholarship winner, Najni Nakhtar ma'am, to start her demonstration and requesting Sephora Salim Shainazi ma'am to look for the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you to the organizing team for arranging such an interesting session and inviting me as well, though it's already late in my time. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Can you guys hear me and see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, my topic is uh, not that much technical, it's just uh, relating to the IEEE Photon Society Scholarship. So I'll be jumping to that. So before jumping on to that, uh, I want to briefly introduce myself, what I'm doing right now as a uh, IEEE um, member and as a volunteer. I'm Nazneya Klam, the chair of IEEE Photon Society and IEEE Sensor Council in my section joint chapter. Apart from this, uh, 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 apart from this designation, I also work as the student editor at IEEE Photon Society Newsletter. I'm also the representative for, for the step and graduate trans, uh, transition representative for the IEEE Photon Society Young Professional Advisory Committee, and also the committee member for the IEEE Photon Society Professional Advancement Committee, uh, as well as the IEEE Women in Photon Task Force member. Uh, I'm also uh, uh, holding the chair for the IEEE Young Professional Miami Section Affinity Group and Women in Engineering uh, Affinity Group. Uh, so these are like little bit introduction of me. So going forward for today's agenda, so what we're going to focus, uh, I'm going to give a brief description of the IEEE Photon Society, what IEEE Photon Society offers so far, what are the hours types, what hours graduate student can uh, uh, apply for. And as I have a win the 2021 IEEE Photonic Society uh, graduate student scholarship, so I'll give a brief overview how, uh, what are the requirements, how you need to prepare your application to get the scholarship. So IEEE Photonic Society is a professional home for all the students, scientists, and engineers who are working on laser optical electronics, photon electronics technology for the betterment of benefits of the humanity. 
the purpose of this society is to like provide the member and the professional growth of, with the professional growth opportunity, publish journal papers, sponsor conference, and support for the local chapters as well as the student around the world, and also supports the outreach activities. IEEE Fortran Society also focus on the diversity because IEEE Fortran Society believes that diversity is essential for the innovation. Diversity is uh, include is uh, uh, is included over the like providing uh, equal opportunity to the scientists and engineers regardless of the ethnicity, race, nationality, religion, gender, age, and identity. IEEE Photon Society also made an initiative for the IEEE Pride in Photonics, which is a really, a really good initiative to focus on the people who are work um, uh, in the Photonics, uh, uh, the LGBT community. IEEE Photonics Society also have the uh, focusing group on IEEE uh, women in Photonics uh, in collaboration with IEEE Women in Engineering. IEEE Photonics Society also gives the platform for the young professional and to help them to elevate in their uh, transition from the graduate student to the profession. Uh, so far, IEEE Photon Society has more than 130 chapters. Uh, These chapters provide the opportunities to network and promote professional growth within the photonics community. The purpose of this chapter is to fulfill the mission of the overall IEEE and enhance the members growth and development throughout the life cycle. And also the retention of the uh, members is also very much important for the IEEE Photonics Society because a graduate student may feel left, uh, like left alone after a completion of the graduation and then starting their professional life. So the retention of the, our member, own member is very important and focusing part for us as well. IEEE Photonics Society chapters uh, has uh, so many uh, activities, including lectures, workshop, regional conference, hours, scholarship, student paper or poster con contest, local humanitarian and service level project work. IEEE Photonics Society gives so many grants for not only for chapters or like a scholarship, apart from this, there are so many other things like for, uh, for a regional chapter or a uh, for society chapter, they can request up to like $2,500 annually for their conferences or for their workshop or any activities uh, that should be done through a proposal. And if actually Photon Society finds a proposal is very interactive and very interesting, then they will fund the program. Apart from this overall, uh, for the IEEE Photonics Society, the, they have the overall grant of like around $30,000 USD for the photonic membership counseling uh, uh, reviews and to approve all the chapter, uh, chapter related grants. Also, apart from this, IEEE uh, Photonics Society gives a student enterprise award and it's up to like, it, it may vary, but it's up to like $1,500 uh, $1, per project proposal. Based on the project, uh, maybe the proposal can be a little, uh, the funding can be a little bit up or low. Uh, it, it depends on the actually the, uh, how strong the proposal is and how strong the, uh, the conference or how strong the uh, workshop will be and how uh, that workshop is uh, going to uh, highlight IEEE Photonics Society's uh, mot motivation and uh, their mission and vision. IEEE Photonics Society also gives this step funding and uh, it's amount is starting from $500 and uh, it's uh, uh, and uh, there's uh, like additional funding available for group over 25 and uh, based, it's also based on the proposal and uh, how you are going to organize this step program based on that the funding can be adjusted. I do believe Photonic Society has this uh, funding outreach activity based on like women focusing uh, mostly on women in photonics. I, it's starting from like $2,500. Still, it may vary based on the proposal you are writing uh, for the, to represent the women in photonics. Also, IEEE Photon Society gives this travel grant, which is like to attend different IEEE Photon Society related conference. It can be a summer, trop IEEE summer tropical conference, it's a, a rapid conference, and IEEE flagship conference, IPC, which is uh, like a starting from today, it's happening right now. Uh, right now it's a virtual, so maybe uh, uh, this travel grant is not uh, available right now, but uh, for, uh, 
in person conferences say this uh, uh, like you can like anyone can apply for this travel grant uh, during 2019 i got like three travel grants to uh, uh, attend three different conferences and which was like uh, i was like great Apart from this uh, ground, ITB Photon Society has uh, like several hours, but today I'm just going to focus on this ITB Photon Society graduate student scholarship. Uh, so to get the purpose of this scholarship is to like promote the graduate students, especially who are at the last stages of pursuing their uh, graduate, like uh, uh, to complete their graduate studies, especially the PhD students. Uh, it, it could be a master's as well, but it should be like uh, uh, the last stage of, of the graduation. The students, um, it's like it, uh, geographically, it's uh, supported by like America's uh, like reason one to seven to nine. I like uh, it's promotes all the geographical uh, IEEE Photon Society member. It, it doesn't like uh, uh, mean like uh, only uh, uh, the particular uh, reason is going to focus. No, you can apply, and uh, if your uh, application is strong enough, then definitely you will get the scholarship. To apply for the scholarship, what you need to do, you need to uh, list down several uh, requirements. First, you have to like uh, uh, listing down like all the related activities you have done so far for the IEEE Photon Society, especially uh, these activities could be the volunteer activities or could be uh, what, what you have done to promote IEEE Photon Society's most motors, visions, uh, something like that. So you have to list down those activities. Second, what you need to do is to write down your CV, uh, where you have to write down all of your degrees received, uh, including the received uh, dates. And then you have to like include all of your educational transcripts so far you have achieved. And then you have to write down a 300 word statement of purpose, which will not exclude like more than 300 words. And it should be focused on your research project interest, what, what is the background of the project, what potential impact can the project can do and uh, what so far you have achieved and how far you have to go and uh, uh, how the research will be continued and developed by the student over the rest of the project if you uh, if you are a fun, if you get the scholarship so regarding the eligibility information you have to include your actually member number you have to include like when you have joined the IEEE Photon Society, like uh, you took the membership for the IEEE Photon Society, uh, your expected uh, date of submission of your thesis or maybe dissertation, your university name, your undergrad uh, grade point average and graduate grade point averages. Those are the eligibility informations. Okay. Next, you have to include all of your publications. These publications will be in two categories. One is the IPS publication, that is IEEE Photon Society-based publication, and another one section will be like non-IEEE Photon Society-based publications. Those uh, publications also you have to uh, categorize like uh, how many journal you have published, uh, how many journal you have published as a first author, and uh, how many uh, first author conference paper you have published. So uh, both for the IEEE Photon Society publication and non IEEE Photon Society publication, you have to uh, categorize this uh, uh, like a first authorship kind of a journal and conference paper. Then uh, you have to write down uh, like uh, the most significant paper and why that paper is significant, no more than 100 words uh, to like the more concise you are about your. Uh, paper, the more you know about your work, right? So you have to like concise all the things, all of your like importance of the project so that they can uh, have a overview of like which paper is important and why it is important, this kind of fact. And lastly, you need to letter of recommendation uh, from the individual uh, uh, that's familiar with your uh, research background and your educational uh, credential. Uh, it can be your advisor, it can be your uh, faculty member, it can be your committee member, or it can be anyone from the IEEE uh, society as well. Uh, it, uh, but they should be uh, like known to your research work. That's the prime category. 
And uh, IEEE Photo and Society has this uh, society newsletter, which is published bi-monthly. So if anyone is working on uh, IEEE, uh, like a uh, photo links uh, field, I will highly encourage to, uh, to follow this newsletter. I'm also the editor for this newsletter as well. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have any interesting workshop, if you have performed any outreach activity based on photonics, uh, if you want to uh, highlight your photonics society chapter, please communicate with our staff member or the uh, IEEE Photonics Society staff member, or you can communicate with me as well to highlight your uh, activities. And also, IEEE uh, this newsletter has a section where you can present your lab, what your lab is doing, how, uh, what kind of research you are doing, your introduction, your research background, those kind of things. So uh, I have attached a picture of mine working in my lab, like, uh, and uh, giving my uh, introduction of uh, my lab. So same thing can goes for you as well. If anyone is working on the photons field, I will highly encourage to please take the advantage and highlight your lab as well. Uh, as I'm the uh, representative for the IEEE Photon Society Student Transition and Innovation Partnership Program, so this program is primarily focused on the value of like mentorship. Uh, IEEE Photon Society really, really uh, uh, like put emphasis on this part, like to have this mentor and mentee kind of concept to help the student to uh, like communicate with uh, any advisor, like in, uh, so that they can be guided through, uh, especially for the conferences platform for the IEEE Photonic Society. If you if you attend any conference for uh, this IEEE Photonic Society, you will you'll see that uh, based on your research background, they will uh, allocate your mentor so that in the conference, you don't feel alone. You can talk to them. Uh, like uh, you, you can have to them with your so many technical questions, your career building question, or maybe you can uh, ask them how you can uh, do the volunteering and other things. Also, this program uh, uh, supports the CV reviewing and mock interviewing, salary negotiation. We uh, we are basically engineer, right? But we do engineering work. But most of the time, what we are like, uh, uh, we are far away from, and that is uh, the leadership quality and how we can build up this leadership quality. That's the most focus of this uh, step program. So we focused on this leadership effectiveness skill. We help students how to like uh, uh, how to uh, uh, adapt with the change management, how to do this interpersonal communication, because most of the time we saw like uh, uh, engineering students don't uh, like feel so shy to initiate a talk to like, uh, like there's a loss of opportunity out there, but you have to take the initiative, go there, talk to someone, like ask for like volunteering activity or ask for any, any, uh, like, uh, uh, any questions, maybe, uh, it's, it's, it's need to be first initiative by you. So that's why interpersonal communication is very much important. And we try to uh, advocate students uh, so that they can uh, overcome these uh, difficulties and then, uh, uh, then shine in their career. Uh, this is the like uh, one highlights that we have recently as uh, this step uh, program is like recently uh, organized by the IEEE Photonics Society. We try to highlight as much as possible the, uh, the like how we are helping students come come to us, we can guide you or we can initiate a program to guide students. So it just like you have to take the initiative. And as uh, um, I already mentioned that I'm the IEEE Photonics Society, the professional advancement committee. So uh, it's also a part of this state program. We try to uh, help students or graduate students or any professionals, how they can improve in their career, or like how if they're like a, a academic, uh, if they want to be in academy, how they can uh, in, uh, enrich their academic career, if they want to go in industry, how they can uh, enrich their industry career, and how they can bridge in between these two. So th that's the purpose of this committee. Uh, IEEE Photo Institute has this like a uh, spotlight kind of thing, membership. If you're, a, if you're an active volunteer, if you're doing so many things for IEEE Photo Institute, they will definitely spotlight you and try to uh, focus your uh, activities, try to give you the platform to speak out. So be, uh, 
be more involved with the society and try to speak out and then you, you will be get uh, so many uh, uh, benefits so many uh, opportunities it just uh, uh, you need to be involved uh these are the IEEE Photon Society Women in India magazines highlights. So far, I have uh, published this uh, uh, writings, uh, this article in the uh, Women in India section. I'm trying to advocate as many as uh, like uh, women that's working in engineering field, especially I'm from Bangladesh. So I'm trying to focus in, uh, on the people from Bangladesh as well. And also uh, people from, not people, like women especially, from other countries as well. I'm, I'm trying to advocate them and trying to folk, like encourage them that uh, how you can believe in yourself and just uh, don't afraid of the challenge and uh, don't be like afraid of the societal norms. Just break down those things and go ahead. Uh, this is the article to focus on our like uh, I have like a, I took the initiative to form this IEEE Young Professional Affinity Group. So uh, IEEE Young Professional Impact Blog highlights this uh, uh, our group activities. Also, I have an initiative this uh, IEEE Photonic Society uh, Miami chapter. Uh, so like it's it's like always you you like we always like ask the question like how we can do the volunteer and uh, how we can be involved sometimes what do you need to do you need to make the chance for other people to do the volunteer you have to take the initiative uh, so far i took the like uh, i uh, submitted two petition uh, one is for this young professional and this uh, photonic society chapter and successfully i formed these two uh, two things one is the affinity group and one is the chapter so uh, I took the initiative, I did, uh, I submitted the petition and formed these chapters. Now I'm giving other people the platform to do the volunteers. So it's not like always you have to wait for the volunteer kind of uh, opportunities. You have to take the initiative and create the platform. Uh, super, I have given like several talks. Uh, uh, before that, uh, I was like giving talks for this Miami section as well. And for the IGP recently, I'm uh, advocating on different things. I'm recently uh, selected as IGP uh, recently uh, uh, diversity and equity and inclusion uh, ad hoc committee members. So we are trying to focus on this, how we can speak out and how we can form like uh, formalize how we can uh, this, uh, uh, formalize all the things and uh, narrow down this diversity, equity and how we can make people feel like you are included. So those kind of things we are like taking the initiative and trying to uh, uh, implement in our uh, like whole reason trip. And uh, as the, my IEEE uh, Photoing Society and IEEE Sensor Council Miami section joint chapter is a very new chapter. I just formed it at uh, August. So far I have like uh, three different uh, talks. It's uh, the first one is uh, based on the priorities in self-care. It's based on like um, uh, stress management and time management. And then we have various one uh, uh, limerical, uh, and just limerical uh, this uh, a uh, software company uh, the, who uh, actively works in this photonic simulation software. So th these uh, talks are like very informative. Also, the last talk was like next generation near uh, sub -nan nanometer optical sensing kind of thing. So these are like all uh, technical talks on very informative. So uh, right now we are arranging for the virtual kind of talk, but in future we are planning to have like, if the COVID situation is like uh, uh, good enough, we are thinking to have a hybrid uh, different talk, workshop and other thing as the uh, IEEE Photoing uh, Society gives so many uh, funding for this chapter. So we are trying to do those things. Uh, my purpose is to highlight this thing to show the students that the, there is like worst opportunity out there. You have to grab the opportunity, take the initiative. It's just not only that uh, you are just applying for this uh, graduate student scholarship. You, you can apply for the travel grant. You can apply for the society chapter fund. You can, so many options is there. You can uh, start working like small like start working on uh, with the small things and then you you will be able to get big big things just it's just a matter of time uh right now i'm just i'm the chair for this chapter and my advisor dr daisy pala he's uh he's working as a like a chapter advisor 
And uh, so far, I have tried to give a brief overview of the IEEE Food Botanic Society's mission and vision, how many awards IEEE Food Botanic Society gives, and uh, how you can apply for the Graduate Student Fellowship Award. So if anyone has any question, they can ask me right now, or they can email me at my email address, and they can connect me with my uh, LinkedIn account as well. So this is all from me. Thank you so much. I guess okay. no one has any question or hi. Do you have any questions? If you have any questions, please write them in the chat box. No one has any question. Okay. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your informative session about IP Police Photonic Society. It was nice to hear. Now, I'm welcoming the collaboration lead at Microsoft, AWS ambassador at Amazon, and business development manager of Vertex IT solution, Safura Salim Shahnazi, ma'am, to start with your session, and also requesting Professor Dr. Muhammad Mushil Hoxar to be ready for the next session. Safura Salim Shahnazi, ma'am. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. And your screen audible. is also visible. I'm Sakura Sadiqsha Hazi, Chairperson of Y. I keep the heart section of EVP Group. By profession, I am a software engineer and working as a business development manager at Vertex IT Solutions. Today, I will talk about building the web capital for an uncertain tomorrow. So, let's start it from leadership. What is leadership? Leadership is a state of mind. It is about character, it is about having the vision. Actually, it is the ability to create bonds. It is about the ability to make people work together towards a common purpose. The question is why build leadership skills for an uncertain time? In simple words, it is the need of time. The world has changed dramatically over the course of the past year, between entire industries collapsing and a high percentage of the workforce suddenly working remotely. Leaders have been faced with the difficult task of being adaptable while keeping operations under control in a time of crisis. As the pandemic progresses into 2021 and COVID-19 vaccination rollouts continue across the globe, there has never been a more crucial time to look beyond and develop the leadership and adjustability skills necessary to help workers stay healthy, safe, and stable during the rapid changes. According to me, there are only six C's of building skills for an uncertain tomorrow. In my experience, these six qualities are crucial for building leadership skills for an uncertain time. That are courage, clear will, creative thinking, communication, calm attitude, and collaboration. So let's start. The first one is courage. It takes bravery to act in the face of uncertainty and ambiguity. Leaders must overcome their doubts and fears and step forward into the unknown. To succeed in every in any environment, you have to believe in yourself. You must have an unshakable confidence in your own ability to achieve your goals and get the job done. And for this, I believe the unshakable confidence starts by understanding your personal strengths and capabilities. The, sec the second trait is clear vision. When things get unstable and unsettled, it's difficult to see the way forward. But creating a clear vision is even more vital. It gives people a direction to follow and common purpose to unite around. They become less distracted and more focused on directing their time and energy into achieving the vision. Okay, let's see into creative thinking. 
when the things used to be just doesn't work anymore or completely shut down so then you need to rethink and reinvent what you do fast and on your feet prototype your concepts test them and then reiterate and as the words move you will be guided to move with it Fourth trait is communication. This is one of the most important traits of building leadership quality for an uncertain time. As a leader, you need to adapt your approach so your message is heard, digested, and retained. Stories engage people, data helps to see and making compassion posters unity and regularly enforcement keeps everyone aligned. So do not forget to communicate in certain times. The best solution to every problem. Hundred percent. Okay, next is collaboration. For a team to work well together in times of crisis, there needs to be a high level of trust, but this can quickly disturb because of people's personal fears and anxiety. So as a leader, don't try to lose over these concerns. Be understandable and let people express their feelings. Bring your team together and make agreements on how to best work together and support each other. When tensions arise, address them quickly by finding common ground. This fosters a great sense of psychological safety and builds a team that's agile and adaptable as they work together to achieve a shared goal. The last point is calm attitude. So, ultimately, in challenging times, people took to leaders to be a pillar of light in a stormy ocean. But this isn't always easy. As a leader, it can take a heavy load on your well-being. Not only are you grappling with your own stresses, but you are also managing a team going through a similar roller coaster ride. So be mindful of the emotional health of the people around you. They simply cannot function effectively if they are struggling. Show that you are here and offer relevant support to help relieve some of their stress. And yes, for yourself, make self care a top priority. Build your inner reserves to regular exercise, a healthy diet, and sleep. Except what you can control and what is out of control. And what things go off track, press pause and take time to rebalance and realign. So in uncertain time, leaders will constant, constantly face setbacks and ultimatum, but the capacity to bounce forward from these is a developable skill. So with these six qualities, leaders can bring strength purpose and dynamic stability to the people around them and be that pillar of light in a stormy ocean. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your valuable information. And at last, I'd like to request the Dean Faculty of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Chittagong University of Engineering and Technology, having more than 145 publications in several international journals and conferences. Also, the Chair of IT Pulley Bangladesh Section, Professor Dr. Muhammad Mushil Hoksar, to conduct his session. Professor Dr. Mohammed Moshil Hoq, sir. Thank you so much uh, for your nice introduction. So I'd like to share my slide. Okay, first of all, it's already night in close to the midnight in Bangladesh. Uh, good night, everyone. Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Dr. Mohammed Faiz Khan, Vice Chancellor BUBT, Honorable Speakers. Susan Kilan, I typically president and CEO, and all the extreme reputed speakers of this session, respected chair, patient, I typically BBT student band official, volunteer and participant. Okay, we know that uh, due to the fourth industrial revolution, the world is transformed uh, our lives, the world of business, the global economy, 
as we know them today. Thus, a significant step in scientific uh, discovery and innovation in many fields must therefore be expected over the coming decade. So today I'd like to uh, share a few insights about the AI and machine learning, which is very, very uh, cutting edge technology uh, applicable for all range of uh, field, including the fourth industrial revolution. And the component uh, of uh, industry 4.0 uh, is developed by the AI and machine learning technology, which is the key of the success of any successful industry. So we already know that. So due to the uh, revolution, fourth industrial uh, revolution is coming from the uh, the IR one to IR four. The world is is connected in a common system, which is called the uh, uh, intranet or the cyber physical system. All the things or devices or instrument or machine man and processes through connected a common network or internet or thus the monitoring of every devices in industry every process and also the the man behind the system it can be monitored properly automated them tuning them for maximizing the product or benefit of the industry so that's why industry four is actually the intelligent networking of machine and process for the industry uh, with the application of various field of information and communication technology, uh, where the automation, data connectivity, and AI and machine learning and other sophisticated technique is actually connected, which operate with an industrial world. So that's why the AI and machine learning, big data, IoT, and all the component of a smart factory or the smart manufacturing industries, uh, they can generate say, lots of data or information which can be used uh, for deciding a better decision uh, for an industry and which may be designed the policy of the upcoming industry uh, for the benefit of their own. So that's why the AI and machine learning for developing a smart system or intelligent system. So AI machine learning is considered as a key ingredient uh, uh, for a successful system, so intelligent system. So due to the time question, I skip uh, most of the slides. So, AI and machine learning and its related component are actually basically the key ingredient for implementing a successful uh, factory or the smart factory, which is the uh, coming in the industrial 4.0. And uh, the main uh, reason to use AI and machine learning in industry 4 is to improve the productivity, efficiency of a company, and how high quality product at a low, low price and uh, design the product as the customer is expected. That's why the, all the uh, product can be designed as a user-centric base and user demand. And also uh, now due to the critical crisis of COVID-19, AI machine learning can be used as a successful technology because it is very difficult for the industry and all the industrial uh, sector and only not on the industrial sector all the sectors are affected uh, by the covid 19 pandemic so that's just why uh, the automation or automatic process or smart or intelligent system uh, can be the only uh, alternative to survive in the industrial world so due to the AI machine learning this is a digital transformation and industrial sector is it can be helped to mitigate uh, the physical process or the current process of industry which can use with revolutionary uh, with maintaining any physical contact from any remote area and by maintaining the efficient uh, or optimized product from the remote location that's why the industry 4.0 uh, can use the AI machine learning is a data oriented system or machine 
which can collect the factory information uh, without the need of human touch or human contact. And this data can be used to system, it can be used for the decision making or for data analytics, or can be uh, viewed from a dashboard from a, from a single monitoring from a single location. That's why it's the benefit of the system is this mass obvious. obvious. So that's why during the time of COVID-19, so experts are suggesting maintaining the social distance and washing the hand may be the, uh, the main concern or, or the awareness uh, which can be uh, suggested for the every people. So that's why the physical contact or in the, in the, the common environment working the people in the industry and mass gathering is, is difficult. So that's why, so if we use the smart industry, smart system, which is run by the AI machine learning technique, so it's maybe the more safer for the crowded area, especially for the industry. And it's also the more convenient for the companies. So that's why the, the data collected from the machine is can be provided for the manufacturer with an, an advanced analytics and allowing company to make the more informed decision and they can estimate uh, the risks and benefit uh, beforehand launching the product in the market. So AI machine learning basically increase the efficiency uh, of the industry based on the existing resources. So that's why real-time error detection and protection, it can be forecasting based on the real-time data of every machine and processes. And also the, the engineer or the process uh, engineer can monitor the every bit of the machine or process by using the video streaming. And this streaming can be analyzed by the machine learning and technique uh, to inspect the every uh, minutes of the product process. So that's why if we use the AI machine learning uh, in the industrial sector, so it can be analyzed the uh, video and the data and that can be uh, identify any problem of the machine or process very easily in real time and can make actionable measure very easily and quickly. So machine learning is very useful because a bigger industry or manufacturing in the industry produces lots of data in every time, in every second. And by inspecting those huge amount of data or big data by the human being is quite impossible in some cases. And sometimes there's some situation, for example, in the real time or dynamic environment where the information is changing continuously. So it cannot be possible to design such kind of uh, smart rules or rule-based system by manipulating every time by the human being. So due to the continuous nature of the information and data. So that's why the machine learning or AI is the only alternative for a, such a situation uh, for making the decision better, more easily, more efficiently, and more quickly. Sometimes it can be said that, so if you if we have a quality data and also the feature extraction technique is rightly chosen and, I, and we can use the better algorithm that in our hand, then a machine learning algorithm can accurately predict a patient with cancer over weeks of six month mortality. So that's why, so the system, if you, can train or build up a model perfectly, then it can be make a decision or prediction it very fast and very quickly than the human being in some cases. So that's why we need to should learn. That means the today's engineer or, or the graduate or student should learn the machine learning for mitigate the upcoming fourth industrial revolution because uh, the industry can use the machine learning technique for cheaper and, uh, and uh, for quicker solution than the other existing system. Because now the computing system is more powerful than the previous and uh, due to the cloud storage, the data is available and affordable to the all. So that's why if we produce, if we, if we use some kinds of intelligent technical tools, uh, which can be applied for the complex situation or complex real world problem, 
So for example, the machine learning and AI, so it can deliver the faster and more accurate solution in most of the cases. So that's why then organization actually has a better chance of identifying uh, the profitable opportunity for his company and also the unknown risks by using the data or by analyzing the data using machine learning. So there are some stats, for example, the AI software will grow from 1.4 billion in 2016 to 59.8 billion by 2025. That means there is a huge opportunity to invest in AI and machine learning based industry for uh, the better benefit of better income. And the recent status says that the 70% of Indian company have invested or willing to invest on machine learning technology. And there is a lots of opportunity for the machine learning engineer in industry. For example, you say there's over the 50,000 plus job are available in data science and machine learning, which is remain unfulfilled due to the shortage of qualifying talents or skill. Only there is a 12,000 per year is demanded in the USA. And more than 4,000 is, is demanded in 2020, the study said there's the four, only 4,000 uh, engineer is demand uh, in the Bangalore city. So that's why, so based on the recent statistics and most demanding job in the market industrial sector, the machine learning is very, very popular and hot uh, career topics. Uh, now and the next few years. And also people are losing their job, traditional company uh, are losing their job and moving their industry to the smart industry uh, due to the food industrial revolution. And it's predicted that 30% of jobs are projected to go on without the next 10 years. So that's why it is a timely initiative, our gadget or, or the talented or the engineer to upskill, to migrate the, the skill into the latest technological invention or cutting edge technology, that means the machine learning AI for uh, successfully tackle the upcoming challenge in phone industrial revolution and for safer, better career. So industry should use uh, the AI machine learning technique for increasing their productivity and also for minimize their human and manual errors and uh, they can optimize the cost and the product cost per unit cost. And also uh, they can design, customize their product based on the user demand or customer demand manufacturing. And all the processes, including machine, human, software, product can be connected by the internet and IoT. That's why the inspection, supervision, modification, and communication of every second or every bit can be possible by using this test technology, which will be very beneficial for the industry. So due to the shortage of time, I skipped the recent advancement of the AI machine. So there are lots of uh, techniques or technologies are available nowadays and, and our research are emphasizing to develop AI and machine learning smart system. And we cannot uh, expand a single day with the use of the AI machine learning apps or application in our life. So AI machine learning is basically, basically dedicated to simplify the human lives, uh, work process or improve the certain industries uh, for their benefits. And these changes brought by the machine learning will bring amazing outcome that will redefine our way of living uh, is time to come. But the problem is that, so there are also some risks for using the machine learning and deep learning uh, based technique because there also, uh, also a risk if we use this technique uh, for uh, designing uh, uh, the, uh, the system that can break the security as well. So that means it can be a catastrophic consequences for the human being or the industry. So that's why there's enormous opportunity and also uh, there is the risk because same technology can be used to secure a system perfectly and same machine learning technique can be used to design to break the system security. So that's why, so there is a need a practical guideline on safe or AI machine learning users and broadly advertise and carefully revise them among the practitioners. So that's why the, all the nation as the atomic energy or atomic power should be joined forces to develop the safe and legal ethical air machine learning strategy or tools and technique. So thank you so much.
So uh, I'd like to appreciate uh, all the patients. Thank you very much. And thank you, sir, for your valuable information about uh, machine learning or uh, artificial intelligence. And we are sorry that we have been late uh, anyway. Now, uh, on the behalf, uh, behalf of organization team, I uh, like to request Paulo Tepera, chairperson of ITPLE ESPE student branch from Equator to share your perceptions about today's summit shortly. Paulo Tepera. Yes, thank you. Ah. Um, well, uh, good afternoon, good evening with everyone, or even good morning if you are from Ecuador like me. Uh, well, on behalf of all the organizational team and of the IEEE branches that organized this event, we want to express our sincere thanks to all the speakers. All the conference have been very interesting and I'm sure that all the conference have helped all the attendees to learn something new today. So we are really glad that you made time for this event and we are appreciate your time. And we also like to thank all the organizational team for their work. And we hope that the international summit has been to your liking. Thank you to the panelists, to the attendees, to the team that prepared the summit for helping us fulfill IEEE's core purpose, foster technological innovation and excellence for the benefit of humanity. Thank you, and I hope you have a great day today. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I request Johnny Dugunek, chairperson of IPP Maribor Student Branch from uh, Slovenia. Please share your perceptions about this summit shortly. Uh, okay, hello. Uh, so I have to say that it was a very good summit, uh, especially because there were a lot of countries involved in the organization. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Tabil who wrote to me first and invited me as part of the organization. And I would like to especially thanks to, I will try to pronounce the names, uh, Tarikul Rimon, Maharin Afros, uh, Ariful Islam Rifat, and Ajmira Noshim for the effort and time that they used for this uh, summit. And I hope that uh, we would also cooperate in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are reaching to the ending moment. So before ending, we can attend again in a photo session. Uh, please turn on your camera for the last time. Everyone, please. Okay, I think it is done. Uh, thank you all the keynote speakers for doing your presentations elegantly and a special thanks to all the presented guests, teachers and attendees for your great patience throughout the summit. It has been a great day with all of you today. Stay safe, stay well. Good night.